Looking for Alaska by John Green Before 136 Days Before The week before I left my family in Florida and the rest of my minor life to go to boarding school in Alabama, my mother insisted on throwing me a going-away party. To say that I had low expectations would be to underestimate the matter dramatically. Although I was more or less forced to invite all my school friends, i.e. the ragtag bunch of drama people and English geeks I sat with by social necessity in the cavernous cafeteria of my public school, I knew they wouldn't come. Still, my mother persevered, awash in delusion that I had kept my popularity secret from her all these years. She cooked a small mountain of artichoke dip. She festooned our living room in green and yellow streamers, the color of my new school. She bought two dozen champagne poppers and placed them around the edge of our coffee table. And when that final Friday came, when my packing was mostly done, she sat with my dad and me on the living room couch at 4.56 p.m. and patiently awaited the arrival of the goodbye to Miles Cavalry. Said cavalry consisted of exactly two people. Marie Lawson, a tiny blonde with rectangular glasses, and her chunky, to put it charitably, boyfriend Will. Hey, Miles, Marie said as she sat down. Hey, I said. How was your summer? Will asked. Okay, yours. Good. We did Jesus Christ Superstar. I helped with the sets. Marie did lights, said Will. That's cool, I nodded knowingly. And that about exhausted our conversational topics. I might have asked a question about Jesus Christ Superstar, except that one, I didn't know what it was. And two, I didn't care to learn. And three, I never really excelled at small talk. My mom, however, can talk small for hours, and so she extended the awkwardness by asking them about their rehearsal schedule and how the show had gone and whether it was a success. I guess it was, Marie said. A lot of people came, I guess. Marie was the sort of person to guess a lot. Finally, Will said, Well, we just dropped by to say goodbye. I've got to get Marie home by six. Have fun at boarding school, Miles. Thanks, I answered relieved. The only thing worse than having a party that no one attends is having a party attended only by two vastly, deeply uninteresting people. They left, and so I sat with my parents and stared at the blank TV and wanted to turn it on, but knew I shouldn't. I can feel them both looking at me, waiting for me to burst into tears or something, as if I hadn't known all along that it would go precisely like this. But I had known. I can feel their pity as they scooped artichoke dip with chips intended for my imaginary friends. But they needed pity more than I did. I wasn't disappointed. My expectations had been met. Is this why you want to leave, Miles? Mom asked. I mulled it over for a moment, careful not to look at her. Uh, no, I said. Well, why then? She asked. This was not the first time she had posed the question. Mom was not particularly keen on letting me go to boarding school and had made no secret of it. Because of me? My dad asked. He had attended Culver Creek, the same boarding school to which I was headed, as had both of his brothers and all of their kids. I think he liked the idea of me following in his footsteps. My uncles had told me stories about how famous my dad had been on campus for having simultaneously raised hell and aced all of his classes. That sounded like a better life than the one I had in Florida. But no, it wasn't because of Dad. Not exactly. Hold on, I said. I went into Dad's study and found his biography of Francois Rabelais. I liked reading biographies of writers, even if, as was the case with Monsieur Rabelais, I never read any of their actual writing. I flipped to the back and found the highlighted quote. Never use a highlighter in my books, my dad had told me a thousand times. But how else are you supposed to find what you're looking for? So this guy... I said, standing in the doorway of the living room, Francois Rabelais. He was his poet, and his last words were, I go to seek a great perhaps. That's why I'm going, so I don't have to wait until I die to start seeking a great perhaps. And that quieted them. I was after a great perhaps, and they knew as well as I did that I wasn't going to find it with the likes of Will and Marie. I sat back down on the couch between my mom and my dad, and my dad put his arm around me. And we stayed there like that, quiet on the couch together, for a long time, until it seemed okay to turn on the TV. And then we ate artichoke dip for dinner and watched the History Channel. 
and his going-away parties go, it certainly could have been worse. 128 days before. Florida was plenty hot, certainly, and humid too. Hot enough that your clothes stuck to you like scotch tape, and sweat dripped like tears from your forehead into your eyes. But it was only hot outside, and generally, I only went outside to walk from one air-conditioned location to another. This did not prepare me for the unique sort of heat that one encounters 15 miles south of Birmingham, Alabama, at Culver Creek Preparatory School. My parents' SUV was parked in the grass, just a few feet outside my dorm room, room 43, but each time I took those few steps to and from the car to unload what now seemed like far too much stuff, the sun burned through my clothes and into my skin with a vicious ferocity that made me genuinely fear hellfire. Between mom and dad and me, it only took a few minutes to unload the car, but my unair conditioned dorm room, although blessedly out of the sunshine, was only modestly cooler. The room surprised me. I'd pictured plush carpet, wood-paneled walls, Victorian furniture. Aside from one luxury, a private bathroom, I got a box. With cinder block walls coated thick with layers of white paint and a green and white checkered linoleum floor, the place looked more like a hospital than the dorm room of my fantasies. A bunk bed of unfinished wood with vinyl mattresses was pushed against the room's back window. The desk and dressers and bookshelves were all attached to the walls in order to prevent creative floor planning. And no air conditioning. I sat in the lower bunk while mom opened the trunk, grabbed the stack of the biographies my dad had agreed to part with, and placed them on the bookshelves. I can unpack, mom, I said. My dad stood. He was ready to go. Let me at least make your bed, mom said. No, really, I can do it. It's okay. Because you simply cannot draw these things out forever. At some point, you just pull up the band-aid, and it hurts. But then it's over, and you're relieved. God, we'll miss you. Mom said, suddenly stepping through the minefield of suitcases to get to the bed. I stood and hugged her. My dad walked over, too, and we formed a sort of huddle. It was too hot, and we were too sweaty for the hug to last terribly long. I knew I ought to cry, but I'd lived with my parents for 16 years, and a trial separation seemed overdue. Don't worry, I smiled. I was gonna learn how to talk right southern. Mom laughed. Don't do anything stupid, my dad said. Okay. No drugs, no drinking, no cigarettes. As an alumnus of Culver Creek, he had done the things I had only heard about. The secret parties, streaking through hay fields. He always whined about how it was all boys back then. Drugs, drinking, and cigarettes. It had taken him a while to kick smoking, but his badass days were now well behind him. I love, I love you. you. They both blurted out simultaneously. It needed to be said, but the words made the whole thing horribly uncomfortable, like watching your grandparents kiss. I love you too. I'll call every Sunday. Our rooms had no phone lines, but my parents had requested I be placed in a room near one of Culver Creek's five pay phones. They hugged me again, mom, then dad, and it was over. Out the back window, I watched them drive the winding road off campus. I should have felt a gooey, sentimental sadness, perhaps, but mostly, I just wanted to cool off. So I grabbed one of the desk chairs and sat down outside my door in the shade of the overhanging eaves, waiting for a breeze that never arrived. The air outside sat as still and oppressive as the air inside. I stared out over my new digs. Six one-story buildings, each with 16 dorm rooms, were arranged in a hexagram around a large circle of grass. It looked like an oversized old motel. Everywhere, boys and girls hugged and smiled and walked together. I vaguely hoped that someone would come up and talk to me. I imagined the conversation. Hey, is this your first year? Yeah, yeah, I'm from Florida. That's cool. So you're used to the heat? I wouldn't be used to this heat if I were from Hades, I'd joke. I'd make a good first impression. Oh, he's funny. That guy Miles is a riot. That didn't happen, of course. Things never happen like I imagined them. Bored, I went back inside, took off my shirt, lay down on the heat-soaked vinyl of the lower bunk mattress, and closed my eyes. I'd never been born again with the baptism and weeping and all that, but it couldn't feel much better than being born again as a guy with no known past. I thought of the people I read about. John F. Kennedy, James Joyce, Humphrey Bogart, who went to boarding school, and their adventures. Kennedy, for example, loved pranks. I thought of the great perhaps and the things that might happen and the people I might meet and who my roommate might be. I got in a letter a few weeks before that gave me his name, Chip Martin, but no other information. 
Whoever Chip Martin was, I hope to God he would bring an arsenal of high-powered fans, because I hadn't packed even one, and I can already feel my sweat pooling on the vinyl mattress, which disgusted me so much that I stopped thinking and got off my ass to find a towel to wipe up the sweat with. And then I thought, well, before the adventure comes the unpacking. I managed to tape a map of the world to the wall and get most of my clothes in the drawers before I noticed that the hot, moist air made even the wall sweat, and I decided that now is not the time for manual labor. Now was the time for a magnificently cold shower. The small bathroom contained a huge, full-length mirror behind a door, and so I could not escape the reflection of my naked self as I leaned in to turn on the shower faucet. My skinniness always surprised me. My thin arms didn't seem to get much bigger as they moved from wrist to shoulder. My chest lacked any hint of either fat or muscle, and I felt embarrassed and wondered if something could be done about the mirror. I pulled open the plain white shower curtain and ducked into the stall. Unfortunately, the shower seemed to have been designed for someone approximately 3 feet 7 inches tall, so the cold water hit my lower rib cage with all the force of a dripping faucet. To wet my sweat-soaked face, I had to spread my legs and squat significantly. Surely, John F. Kennedy, who was 6 feet tall according to his biography, my height exactly, did not have to squat at his boarding school. No, this was a different beast entirely, and as a dribbling shower slowly soaked my body, I wondered whether I can find a great perhaps here at all, or whether I had made a grand miscalculation. When I opened the bathroom door after my shower, a towel wrapped around my waist, I saw a short, muscular guy with a shock of brown hair. He was hauling a gigantic army green duffel bag through the door of my room. He stood five feet in nothing, but was well built, like a scale model of Adonis, and with him arrived the stink of stale cigarette smoke. Great, I thought. I'm meeting my roommate naked. He heaved the duffel into the room, closed the door, and walked over to me. I'm Chip Martin, he announced in a deep voice, the voice of a radio DJ. Before I can respond, he added, I'd shake your hand, but I think you should hold on damn tight to that towel till you get some clothes on. I laughed and nodded my head at him. That's cool, right? The nod. And said, I'm Miles Halter. Nice to meet you. Miles? As in, to go before I sleep? He asked me. Huh? It's a Robert Frost poem. You've never read him? I shook my head no. Consider yourself lucky. He smiled. I grabbed some clean underwear, a pair of blue Adidas soccer shorts, and a white t-shirt, mumbled that I'd be back in a second, and ducked back into the bathroom. <sighs> so much for a good first impression. So where are your parents? I asked from the bathroom. My parents? The father's in California right now. Maybe sitting in his lazy boy, maybe driving his truck. Either way, he's drinking. My mother is probably just now turning off campus. Oh, I said. Dress now. Not sure how to respond to such personal information. I shouldn't have asked, I guess, if I didn't want to know. Chip grabbed some sheets and tossed them onto the top bunk. I'm a top bunk man. Hope that doesn't bother you. Uh, no. Whatever is fine. I see you've decorated the place. He said, gesturing toward the world map. I like it. And then he started naming countries. He spoke in a monotone, as if he'd done it a thousand times before. Afghanistan, Albania, Algeria, American Samoa, Andorra, and so on. He got through the A's before looking up and noticing my incredulous stare. I could do the rest, but it'd probably bore you. Something I learned over the summer. God, you can't imagine how boring New Hope, Alabama is in the summertime. Like watching soybeans grow. Where are you from, by the way? Florida, I said. Never been. That's pretty amazing. The country's thing, I said. Yeah, everybody's got a talent. I can memorize things. And you can... Um, I know a lot of people's last words. It was an indulgence, learning last words. Other people had chocolate. I had dying declarations. Example. I like Henrik Ibsen's. He was a playwright. I knew a lot about Ibsen, but I never read any of his plays. I didn't like reading plays. I liked reading biographies. Yeah, I know who he was. Said Chip. Right, well, he'd been sick for a while, and his nurse said to him, you seem to be feeling better this morning. And Ibsen looked at her and said, on the contrary. And then he died. Chip laughed. <laughs> That's morbid, but I like it. He told me he was in his third year at Culver Creek. He had started in ninth grade, the first year at the school, and was now a junior like me. A scholarship kid, he said. Got a full ride. He heard it was the best school in Alabama, so he wrote his application essay about how he wanted to go to a school where he could read long books. The problem, he said in the essay, was that his dad would always hit him with the books in his house, so Chip kept his book short and paperback for his own safety. His parents got divorced his sophomore year, 
He liked the creek, as he called it, but... You have to be careful here, with students and with teachers. And I do hate being careful. He smirked. I hated being careful, too, or wanted to, at least. He told me this while ripping through his duffel bag, throwing clothes into drawers with reckless abandon. Chip did not believe in having a sock drawer or a t-shirt drawer. He believed that all drawers were created equal and filled each with whatever fit. My mother would have died. As soon as he finished unpacking, Chip hit me roughly in the shoulder, said, I hope you're stronger than you look, and walked out the door, leaving it open behind him. He peeked his head back in a few seconds later and saw me standing still. Well, come on, miles to go, halter. We got shit to do. We made our way to the TV room, which, according to Chip, contained the only cable TV on campus. Over the summer, it served as a storage unit, packed nearly to the ceiling with couches, fridges, and rolled-up carpets. The TV room undulated with kids trying to find and haul away their stuff. Chip said hello to a few people, but didn't introduce me. As he wandered through the couch stock maze, I stood near the room's entrance, trying my best not to block pairs of roommates as they maneuvered furniture through the narrow front door. It took ten minutes for Chip to find his stuff, and an hour more for us to make four trips back and forth across the dorm circle between the TV room and room 43. By the end, I wanted to crawl into Chip's mini-fridge and sleep for a thousand years, but Chip seemed immune to both fatigue and heat stroke. I sat down on his couch. I found it lying on a curb in my neighborhood a couple years ago. He said of the couch as he worked on setting up my PlayStation 2 on top of his footlocker. I know the leather's got some cracks, but come on, that's a damn nice couch. The leather had more than a few cracks. It was about 30% baby blue faux leather and 70% foam, but it felt damn good to me anyway. All right, he said. We're about done. He walked over to his desk and pulled a roll of duct tape from a drawer. We just need your trunk. I got up pulled the trunk out from under the bed, and Chip situated it between the couch and the PlayStation 2. It started tearing off thin strips of duct tape. He applied them to the trunk so that they spelled out coffee table. There, he said. He sat down and put his feet up on the, uh, coffee table. Done. I sat down next to him, and he looked over at me and suddenly said, Listen, I'm not going to be your entree to Culver Creek social life. Uh, okay, I said, but I could hear the words catch in my throat. I just carried this guy's couch beneath a white hot sun, and now he didn't like me? Basically, you've got two groups here, he explained, speaking with increasing urgency. You've got the regular boarders, like me, and then you've got the weekday warriors. They board here, but they're all rich kids who live in Birmingham and go home to their parents' air-conditioned mansions every weekend. Those are the cool kids. I don't like them. And they don't like me. And so if you came here thinking that you were hot shit at public school, so you'll be hot shit here, you'd best not be seen with me. You did go to public school, didn't you? Uh, I said, absentmindedly. I began picking up the cracks in the couch's leather, digging my fingers into the foamy whiteness. (laughs) Right, you did, probably, because if you had gone to private school, your freaking shorts would fit. He laughed. I wore my shorts just below my hips, which I thought was cool. Finally, I said, yeah, I went to public school, but it wasn't hot shit there, Chip. I was regular shit. Ha! That's good. And don't call me Chip. Call me the Colonel. I stifled a laugh. The Colonel? Yeah, the Colonel. And we'll call you, hmm, Pudge. Huh? Pudge, the Colonel said. Because you're skinny. It's called Irony, Pudge. Heard of it? Now, let's go get some cigarettes and start this year off right. He walked out of the room, again, just assuming I'd follow, and this time, I did. Mercifully, the sun was descending toward the horizon. We walked five doors down to room 48. A dry erase board was taped to the door using duct tape. In blue marker, it read, Alaska has a single. The colonel explained to me that one, this was Alaska's room, and that two, she had a single room because the girl who was supposed to be her roommate got kicked out at the end of last year, and at three, Alaska had cigarettes. Although, the colonel neglected to ask whether four, I smoked, which five, I didn't. He knocked once, loudly. Through the door, a voice screamed. Oh my god, come in, you short little man, because I have the best story. We walked in. I turned to close the door behind me, and the colonel shook his head and said, After seven, you have to leave the door open if you're in a girl's room. But I barely heard him, because the hottest girl in all of human history was standing before me in cut-off jeans and a peach tank top. And she was talking over the colonel, talking loud and fast. So, 
First day of summer, I'm in Grand Old Vine Station with this boy named Justin, and we're at his house watching TV on the couch, and mind you, I'm already dating Jake. Actually, I'm still dating him, miraculously enough, but Justin is a friend of mine from when I was a kid, and so we're watching TV and literally chatting about SATs or something, and Justin puts his arm around me, and I think, oh, that's nice, we've been friends for so long, and this is totally comfortable. And we're just chatting, and then I'm in the middle of a sentence about analogies or something. And like a hawk, he reaches down, and he honks my boob. Honk. A much too firm two to three second honk. And the first thing I thought was, okay, how do I extricate this claw from my boob before it leaves permanent marks? And the second thing I thought was, God, I can't wait to tell Takumi and the colonel. The colonel laughed. I stared, stunned partly by the force of the voice emanating from the petite but god curvy girl, and partly by the gigantic stacks of books that lined her walls. Her library filled her bookshelves, and then overflowed into waist-high stacks of books everywhere, piled haphazardly against the walls. If just one of them moved, I thought the domino effect could engulf the three of us in an asphyxiating mass of literature. Who's the guy not laughing at my very funny story? She asked. Oh, right. Um, Alaska, this is Pudge. Pudge memorizes people's last words. Pudge, this is Alaska. She got her boob honked over the summer. She walked over to me with her hand extended, then made a quick move downward at the last moment and pulled down my shorts. Those are the biggest shorts in the state of Alabama. I like them baggy, I said, embarrassed, and pulled them up. They had been cool back home in Florida. So far in our relationship, Pudge, I've seen your chicken legs entirely too often. The curdle deadpanned. So, Alaska... Sell us some cigarettes. And then somehow the colonel talked me into paying $5 for a pack of Marlboro Lights I had no intention of ever smoking. He asked Alaska to join us, but she said, I have to find Takumi and tell him about the honk. She turned to me and asked, Have you seen him? I had no idea whether I'd seen Takumi, since I had no idea who he was. I just shook my head. All right, meet you at the lake in a few minutes then. The colonel nodded. At the edge of the lake, just before the sandy, and the colonel told me, fake, beach, we sat down in the Adirondack swing. I made the obligatory joke, don't grab my boob. The colonel gave me an obligatory laugh, then asked, Want to smoke? I had never smoked a cigarette, but when in Rome, is it safe here? Not really, he said, then lit a cigarette and handed it to me. I inhaled, coughed, wheezed, gasped for breath, coughed again, considered vomiting, grabbed the swinging bench, head spinning, and threw the cigarette to the ground and stomped on it, convinced my great perhaps did not involve cigarettes. (laughs) Smoke much? He laughed, then pointed to a white speck across the lake and said, See that? Yeah, I said. What is that, a bird? It's the swan, he said. Wow, a school with a swan. Wow. That swan is the spawn of Satan. Never get closer to it than we are now. Why? It has some issues with people. It was abused or something. It'll rip you to pieces. The eagle put it there to keep us from walking around the lake to smoke. The eagle? Mr. Starnes. Codename, the eagle. The dean of students. Most of the teachers live on campus, and they'll all bust you. But only the eagle lives in the dorm circle, and he sees all. He can smell a cigarette from like five miles. Isn't his house back there? I asked, pointing to it. I can see the house quite clearly, despite the darkness. So it followed, he can probably see us. Yeah. But it doesn't really go into Blitzkrieg mode until classes start. Chip said nonchalantly. God, if I get in trouble, my parents will kill me, I said. I suspect you're exaggerating. But look, you're going to get in trouble. 99% of the time, your parents never have to know, though. The school doesn't want your parents to think you became a fuck-up here any more than you want your parents to think you're a fuck-up. He blew a thin stream of smoke forcefully toward the lake. I had to admit, he looked cool doing it. Taller, somehow. Anyway, when you get in trouble, just don't tell anyone. I mean, I hate the rich snots here with a fervent passion I usually reserve only for dental work and my father. But that doesn't mean I would rat them out. Pretty much the only important thing is never, 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 never rat. Okay, I said, although I wondered. If someone punches me in the face, I'm supposed to insist that I ran into a door? It seemed a little stupid. How do you deal with bullies and assholes if you can't get them into trouble? I didn't ask Chip, though. All right, Pudge. We have reached the point in the evening when I'm obliged to go and find my girlfriend. So give me a few of those cigarettes you'll never smoke anyway, and I'll see you later. 
I decided to hang out on the swing for a while, half because the heat had finally dissipated into a pleasant, if muggy, 80-something, and half because I thought Alaska might show up. But almost as soon as the colonel left, the bugs encroached. No CMs, which, for the record, you can see, and mosquitoes hovered around me in such numbers that the tiny noise of their rubbing wings sounded cacophonous, and then I decided to smoke. Now, I did think the smoke will drive the bugs away, and to some degree, it did. I'd be lying, though, if I claimed I became a smoker to ward off insects. I became a smoker because, one, I was on an Adirondack swing by myself, and two, I had cigarettes, and three, I figured that if everyone else can smoke a cigarette without coughing, I can damn well, too. In short, I didn't have a very good reason. So yeah, let's just say that four, it was the bugs. I made it through three entire drags before I felt nauseous and dizzy and only semi-pleasantly buzzed. I got up to leave. As I stood, a voice behind me said, So, do you really memorize last words? She ran up beside me and grabbed my shoulder and pushed me back onto the porch swing. Yeah, I said, and then hesitantly I added, You want to quiz me? JFK. She said, That's obvious, I answered. Oh, is it now? She asked. No, those were his last words. Someone said, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. And then he said, that's obvious. And then he got shot. She laughed. (laughs) God, that's awful. I shouldn't laugh, but I will. And then she laughed again. Okay, Mr. Famous Last Words Boy, I have one for you. She reached into her overstuffed backpack and pulled out a book. Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the general in his labyrinth. Absolutely one of my favorites. It's about Simon Bolivar. I didn't know who Simon Bolivar was, but she didn't give me time to ask. It's a historical novel, so I don't know if this is true, but in the book, do you know what his last words are? No, you don't. But I am about to tell you, senior parting remarks. And then she lit a cigarette and sucked on it so hard for so long, I thought the entire thing might burn off in one drag. She exhaled and read to me, He, that's Simon Bolivar was shaken by the overwhelming revelation that the headlong race between his misfortunes and his dreams was at that moment reaching the finish line. The rest was darkness. Damn it, he sighed. How will I ever get out of this labyrinth? I knew great last words when I heard them, and I made a mental note to get a hold of a biography of this Simon Bolivar fellow. Beautiful last words, but I didn't quite understand. So what's the labyrinth? I asked her. And now is as good a time as any to say that she was beautiful. In the dark beside me, she smelled of sweat and sunshine and vanilla, and on that thin moon night, I can see little more than her silhouette, except for when she smoked, when the burning cherry of the cigarette washed her face in a pale red light. But even in the dark, I could see her eyes, fierce emeralds. She had the kind of eyes that predisposed you to supporting her every endeavor, and not just beautiful, but hot, too, with her breast straining against her tight tank top, her curved legs swinging back and forth beneath the swing, flip-flops dangling from her electric blue painted toes. It was right then, between when I asked about the labyrinth and when she answered me, that I realized the importance of curves, of the thousand places where girls' bodies ease from one place to another, from arc of the foot to ankle to calf, from calf to hip to waist to breast to neck, to ski slope nose to forehead, to shoulder to the concave arch of the back to the butt to the etc. I noticed curves before, of course, but I had never quite apprehended their significance. Her mouth close enough to me that I could feel her breath warmer than the air, she said. That's the mystery, isn't it? Is the labyrinth living or dying? Which is he trying to escape? The world or the end of it? I waited for her to keep talking, but after a while it became obvious she wanted an answer. Uh, I don't know, I said finally. Have you really read all those books in your room? She laughed. Oh, God, no. I've maybe read a third of them, but I'm going to read them all. I call it my life's library. Every summer since I was little, I've gone to garage sales and bought all the books that looked interesting. So I always have something to read. But there's so much to do. Cigarettes to smoke, sex to have, swings to swing on. I'll have more time for reading when I'm old and boring. She told me that I reminded her of the colonel when he came to Culver Creek. They were freshmen together, she said, both scholarship kids with, as she put it, a shared interest in booze and mischief. The phrase booze and mischief left me worrying. I'd stumbled in what my mother referred to as the wrong crowd, but for the wrong crowd, they both seemed awfully smart. As she lit a new cigarette off the butt of her previous one, she told me that the colonel was smart, but hadn't done much living when he got to the creek. I got rid of that problem quickly, she smiled. By November, I'd gotten him his first girlfriend. 
a perfectly nice non-weekday warrior named Janice. He dumped her after a month because she was too rich for his poverty-soaked blood. But whatever. We pulled our first prank that year. We filled classroom four with a thin layer of marbles. We've progressed some since then, of course. She laughed. So Chip became the colonel, the military-style planner of their pranks, and Alaska was ever Alaska, the larger-than-life creative force behind them. You're smart like him, she said. Quieter, though, and cuter. But I didn't even just say that, because I love my boyfriend. Yeah, you're not bad either, I said, overwhelmed by your compliment. But I didn't just say that, because I love my girlfriend. <laughs> oh, wait, right, I don't have one. She laughed. <laughs> yeah, don't worry, Budge. If there's one thing I can get you, it's a girlfriend. Let's make a deal. You figure out what the labyrinth is, and how to get out of it, and I'll get you laid. Deal. We shook on it. Later, I walked toward the dorm circle beside Alaska. The cicadas hummed their one-note song, just as they had at home in Florida. She turned to me as we made our way through the darkness and said, When you're walking at night, do you ever get creeped out? And even though it's silly and embarrassing, you just want to run home? It seemed too secret and personal to admit to a virtual stranger, but I told her, yeah, totally. For a moment, she was quiet, and she grabbed my hand, whispered, Run, 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 and took off, pulling me behind her. 127 Days Before Early the next afternoon, I blinked sweat from my eyes as I taped a Van Gogh poster to the back of the door. The colonel sat on the couch, judging whether the poster was level and fielding my endless questions about Alaska. What's her story? She's from Vine Station. You could drive past it without noticing, and from what I understand, you ought to. Her boyfriend's at Vanderbilt on scholarship, plays bass in some band. I don't know much about her family. So she really likes him? I guess. She hasn't cheated on him, which is a first. And so on, all morning. I'd been unable to care about anything else, not the Van Gogh poster and not video games, not even my class schedule, which the Eagle had brought by that morning. He introduced himself, too. Welcome to Culver Creek, Mr. Halter. You're given a large measure of freedom here. If you abuse it, you'll regret it. You seem like a nice young man. I'd hate to have to bid you farewell. And then he stared at me in a manner that was either serious or seriously malicious. Alaska calls that the look of doom. The colonel told me after the eagle left. The next time you see that, you're busted. Okay, Pudge. The colonel said as I stepped away from the poster. Not entirely level, but close enough. Enough with Alaska already. By my count, there are 92 girls at this school, and every last one of them is less crazy than Alaska, who, I might add, already has a boyfriend. I'm going to lunch. It's Bufrito Day. He walked out, leaving the door open. Feeling like an over-infatuated idiot, I got up to close the door. The colonel, already halfway across the dorm circle, turned around. Christ, are you coming or what? You can say a lot of bad things about Alabama, but you can't say that Alabamans, as a people, are unduly afraid of deep fryers. And that first week at the creek, the cafeteria served fried chicken, chicken fried steak, and fried okra, which marked my first foray into the delicacy that is the fried vegetable. I have expected them to fry the iceberg lettuce. But nothing matched the buffrito, a dish created by Maureen, the amazingly and understandably obese Culver Creek cook. A deep-fried bean burrito, the buffrito proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that frying always improves a food. Sitting with the colonel and five guys I didn't know at a circular table in the cafeteria that afternoon, I sank my teeth into the crunchy shell of my first buffrito and experienced a culinary orgasm. My mom cooked okay but I immediately wanted to bring Marine home with me over Thanksgiving. The colonel introduced me as Pudge to the guys at the wobbly wooden table, but I only registered the name Takumi, whom Alaska had mentioned yesterday. A thin Japanese guy only a few inches taller than the colonel, Takumi talked with his mouth full as I chewed slowly, savoring the beanie crunch. God, Takumi said to me. There's nothing like watching a man eat his first Bufrito. I didn't say much, partly because no one asked me any questions, and partly because I just wanted to eat as much as I could. But Takumi felt no such modesty. He could, and did, eat and chew and swallow while talking. The lunch discussion centered on the girl who was supposed to have been Alaska's roommate, Maria, and her boyfriend, Paul, who had been a weekday warrior. They'd gotten kicked out in the last week of the previous school year, I learned, for what the colonel called the trifecta. They were caught committing three of Culver Creek's expellable offenses at once, lying naked in bed together, 
genital contact being offensive, number one. Already drunk, number two, they were smoking a joint, number three. When the eagle burst in on them, rumors had it that someone had ratted them out, and Takumi seemed intent on finding out who. Intent enough, anyway, to shout about it with his mouth jam-packed with buff Frito. Paul was an asshole, the colonel said. I wouldn't have ratted on them, but anyone who shacks up with a jaguar-driving weekday warrior like Paul deserves what she gets. Dude, Takumi responded, Your girlfriend? And then he swallowed a bite of food. Is a weekday warrior. <laughs> True. The colonel laughed. Much to my chagrin, that is an incontestable fact. But she is not as big an asshole as Paul. Not quite. Takumi smirked. The colonel laughed again, and I wonder why he wouldn't stand up for his girlfriend. I wouldn't have cared if my girlfriend was a jaguar driving cyclops with a beard. I'd have been grateful just to have someone to make out with. That evening, when the colonel dropped by room 43 to pick up the cigarettes, he seemed to have forgotten that they were technically mine. I didn't really care when he didn't invite me out with him. In public school, I'd known plenty of people who made it a habit to hate this kind of person or that kind. The geeks hated the preps, etc., and it always seemed like a big waste of time to me. The colonel didn't tell me where he'd spent the afternoon or where he was going to spend the evening, but he closed the door behind him when he left, so I guessed I wasn't welcome. Just as well, I spent the night surfing the web, no porn, I swear, and reading The Final Days, a book about Richard Nixon and Watergate. For dinner, I microwaved a refrigerated burrito the colonel had snuck out of the cafeteria. It reminded me of nights in Florida, except with better food and no air conditioning. Lying in bed and reading felt pleasantly familiar. I decided the heed what I'm sure would have been my mother's advice and get a good night's sleep before my first day of classes. French 2 started at 8.10, and figuring it couldn't take more than 8 minutes to put on some clothes and walk to the classrooms, I set my alarm for 8.02. I took a shower, then lay in bed waiting for sleep to save me from the heat. Around 11, I realized that the tiny fan clipped to my bunk might make more of a difference if I took off my shirt, and I finally fell asleep on top of the sheets, wearing just boxers. A decision I found myself regretting some hours later when I awoke to two sweaty, meaty hands shaking the holy hell out of me. I woke up completely and instantly, sitting up straight in bed, terrified, and I couldn't understand the voices for some reason couldn't understand why there were any voices at all, and what the hell time was it anyway. And finally, my head cleared enough to hear, Come on, kid, don't make us kick your ass, just get up! And then from the top bunk, I heard, Rise, budge, just get up. So I got up and saw for the first time three shadowy figures. Two of them grabbed me, one with a hand on each of my upper arms, and walked me out of the room. On the way out, the colonel mumbled, Have a good time. Go be easy on him, Kevin. They led me almost at a jog behind my dorm building, and then across the soccer field. The ground was grassy but gravelly too, and I wondered why no one had shown the common courtesy to tell me to put on shoes, and why I was out there in my underwear, chicken legs exposed to the world. A thousand humiliations crossed my mind. There's the new junior, Miles Halter, handcuffed to the soccer goal wearing only his boxers. I imagined them taking me into the woods, where we now seemed headed, and beating the shit out of me so that I looked great for my first day of school. And the whole time I just stared at my feet, because I didn't want to look at them, and I didn't want to fall. So I watched my steps, trying to avoid the bigger rocks. I felt the fight-or-flight reflex swell up in me over and over again, but I knew that neither fight nor flight had ever worked for me before. They took me a roundabout way to the fake beach, and then I knew what would happen. A good old-fashioned dunking in the lake. And I calmed down a bit. I can handle that. When we reached the beach, they told me to put my arms at my sides, and the beefiest guy grabbed two rolls of duct tape from the sand. With my arms flat against my sides, like a soldier at attention, they mummified me from my shoulder to my wrist. Then they threw me down on the ground. The sand from the fake beach cushioned the landing, but I still hit my head. Two of them pulled my legs together, while the other one, Kevin, I'd figured out, put his angular, strong-jawed face up so close to mine that the gel-soaked spikes of hair pointing out from his forehead poked at my face and told me, This is for the colonel. You should not be hanging out with that asshole. They taped my legs together, from ankles to thighs. I looked like a silver mummy. I said, Please, guys, don't, just before they taped my mouth shut. Then they picked me up and hurled me into the water. Sinking. Sinking, but instead of feeling panic or anything else, I realized that please guys don't were terrible last words. But then, the great miracle of the human species, our buoyancy, came through, and as I felt myself floating toward the surface, I twisted and turned as best as I could so that the warm night air hit my nose first. And I breathed. I wasn't dead and wasn't going to die. 
Well, I thought that wasn't so bad, but there was still the small matter of getting to shore before the sun rose. First, to determine my position vis-a-vis -vis the shoreline. If I tilted my head too much, I felt my whole body start to roll, and on the long list of unpleasant ways to die, face down in soaking wet white boxers is pretty high up there. So instead, I rolled my eyes and craned my neck back, my eyes almost underwater until I saw that the shore, not ten feet away, was directly behind my head. I began to swim, an armless silver mermaid using only my hips to generate motion, until finally my ass scraped against the lake's mucky bottom. I turned and used my hips and waist to roll three times until I came ashore near a ratty green towel. They left me a towel. How thoughtful. The water had seeped under the duct tape and loosened the adhesive's grip on my skin, but the tape was wrapped around me three layers deep in places, which necessitated wiggling like a fish out of water. Finally, it loosened enough for me to slip my left hand up and out against my chest and rip the tape off. I wrapped myself in the sandy towel. I didn't want to go back to my room and see Chip, because I had no idea what Kevin had meant. Maybe if I went back to the room, they'd be waiting for me and they'd get me for real. Maybe I needed to show them, okay, got your message, she's just my roommate, not my friend. And anyway, I didn't feel terribly friendly towards the colonel. Have a good time, he'd said. Yeah, I thought. I had a ball. So I went to Alaska's room. I didn't know what time it was, but I could see a faint light underneath her door. I knocked softly. Yeah. She said, and I came in, wet and sandy and wearing only a towel and soaking boxers. This was not, obviously, how you want the world's hottest girl to see you, but I figured she can explain to me what had just happened. She put down a book and got out of bed with a sheet wrapped around her shoulders. For a moment, she looked concerned. She looked like the girl I met yesterday, the girl who said I was cute and bubbled over with energy and silliness and intelligence. And then she laughed. Guess you went for a swim, huh? And she said it with such casual malice that I felt that everyone had known, and I wondered why the whole damn school agreed in advance to possibly drown Miles Halter. But Alaska liked the colonel, and in the confusion of the moment, I just looked at her blankly, unsure even of what to ask. Give me a break, she said. Come on, you know what? There are people with real problems. I've got real problems. Mommy ain't here, so buck up, big guy. I left without saying a word to her and went to my room, slamming the door behind me, waking the colonel and stomping into the bathroom. I got in the shower to wash the algae in the lake off me, but the ridiculous faucet of a shower had failed spectacularly, and how could Alaska and Kevin and those other guys already dislike me? After I finished the shower, I dried off and went into the room to find some clothes. So, he said, what took you so long? Get lost on your way home? They said it was because of you. I said, and my voice betrayed a hint of annoyance. They said I shouldn't hang out with you. What? No, it happens to everybody. The colonel said. It happened to me. They throw you in the lake. You swim out. You walk home. I couldn't just swim out, I said softly, pulling on a pair of jean shorts beneath my towel. They duct taped me. I couldn't even move, really. Wait, wait. He said, and hopped out of his bunk, staring at me through the darkness. They taped you? How? And I showed him. I stood like a mummy with my feet together and my hands at my sides and showed him how they'd wrap me up, and then I plopped down onto the couch. Christ! You could have drowned! They're just supposed to throw you in the water in your underwear and run! He shouted. What the hell were they thinking? Who was it? Kevin Richmond and who else? Do you remember their faces? Yeah, I think. Why the hell would they do that? He wondered. Did you do something to them? I asked. No, but I'm sure as shit gonna do something to them now. We'll get them. It wasn't a big deal. I got out fine. You could have died. And I could have, I suppose, but I didn't. Well, maybe I should just go to the Eagle tomorrow and tell him, I said. Absolutely not. He answered. He walked over to his crumpled shorts lying on the floor and pulled out a pack of cigarettes. He lit two and handed one to me. I smoked the whole goddamn thing. You're not. He continued. Because that's not how shit gets dealt with here. And besides, you really don't want to get a reputation for ratting. But we will deal with those bastards, Pudge. I promise you, they will regret messing with one of my friends. And if the colonel thought that calling me his friend would make me stand by him, well, he was right. Alaska was kind of mean to me tonight, I said. I leaned over, opened an empty desk drawer, and used it as a makeshift ashtray. Like I said, she's moody. I went to bed wearing a t-shirt, shorts, and socks. No matter how miserably hot it got, I resolved I would sleep in my clothes every night at the creek, feeling, probably for the first time in my life, the fear and excitement of living in a place where you never know what's going to happen or when. 126 Days Before Well, now it's war! 
The colonel shouted the next morning. I rolled over and looked at the clock. 7.52. My first Culver Creek class, French, started in 18 minutes. I blinked a couple times and looked up at the colonel, who was standing between the couch and the coffee table, holding his well-worn, once-white tennis shoes by the laces. For a long time he stared at me, and I stared at him. And then, almost in slow motion, a grin crept across the colonel's face. I've got to hand it to them, he said finally. That was pretty clever. What? I asked. Last night? Before they woke you up, I guess. They pissed in my shoes. Are you sure? I said, not trying to laugh. Do you care to smell? He asked, holding the shoes toward me. Because I went ahead and smelled them, and yes, I am sure. If there's one thing I know, it's when I've just stepped in another man's piss. It's like my mom always says. You think you's a walking on water, but turns out you just got piss in your shoes. Point those guys out to me if you see them today. He added. Because we need to figure out why they're so d pissed at me. And then we need to go ahead and start thinking of how we're going to ruin their miserable little lives. When I received the Culver Creek handbook over the summer, I noticed happily that the dress code section contained only two words. Casual modesty. It never occurred to me that girls would show up for class half asleep in cotton pajama shorts, t-shirts, and flip-flops. Modest, I guess, and casual. And there was something about girls wearing pajamas, even if modest, which might have made French at 8.10 in the morning bearable, if I had any idea what Madame O'Malley was talking about. Comment dit tu, oh my god, I don't know nearly enough French to pass French 2 en français. My French 1 class back in Florida did not prepare me for Madame O'Malley, who skipped the How Was Your Summer pleasantries and dove directly into something called the Passi Compusi, which is apparently a verb tense. Alaska sat directly across from me in the circle of desk, but she didn't look at me once the entire class, even though I could notice little but her. Maybe she could be mean, but the way she talked the first night about getting out of the labyrinth? So smart. And the way her mouth curled up on the right side all the time, like she was preparing to smirk, like she'd mastered the right half of the Mona Lisa's imitable smile. From my room, the student population seemed manageable, but it overwhelmed me in the classroom area, which was a single, long building just beyond the dorm circle. The building was split into 14 rooms facing out toward the lake. Kids crammed the narrow sidewalks in front of the classrooms, and even though finding my classes wasn't hard, even with my poor sense of direction, I can get from French and room 3 to pre-calc in room 12. I felt unsettled all day. I didn't know anyone and couldn't even figure out whom I should be trying to know, and the classes were hard, even on the first day. My dad had told me I'd have to study, and now I believed him. The teachers were serious and smart, and a lot of them went by doctor. And so when the time came for my last class before lunch, world religions, I felt tremendous relief. A vestige from when Culver Creek was a Christian boys school. I figured the world religions class required of every junior and senior might be an easy A. It was my only class all day where the desks weren't arranged either in a square or a circle. So not wanting to seem eager, I sat down in the third row at 11.03. I was seven minutes early, partly because I liked to be punctual and partly because I didn't have anyone to chat with out in the halls. Shortly thereafter, the colonel came in with Takumi. They sat down on opposite sides of me. I heard about last night, Takumi said. Alaska's pissed. That's weird, since she was such a bitch last night, I blurted out. Takumi just shook his head. Yeah, well, she didn't know about the whole story. And people are moody, dude. You gotta get used to living with people. You could have worse friends then. The colonel cut him off. Enough of the psychobabble, MC Dr. Phil. Let's talk counterinsurgency. People were starting to file into class, so the colonel leaned in toward me and whispered, If any of them are in this class, let me know, okay? Just, here, just put X's where they're sitting. And he ripped a sheet of paper out of his notebook and drew a square for each desk. As people filed in, I saw one of them. The tall one with immaculately spiky hair, Kevin. Kevin stared down the colonel as he walked past, but in trying to stare, he forgot to watch his step and bumped his thigh against the desk. The colonel laughed. One of the other guys, the one who was either a little fat or worked out too much, came in behind Kevin sporting pleated khaki pants and a short-sleeved black polo shirt. As they sat down, I crossed through the appropriate squares on the colonel's diagram and handed it to him. Just then, the old man shuffled in. He breathed slowly and with great labor through his wide-open mouth. He took tiny steps towards the lectern, his heels not moving much past his toes. The colonel nudged me and pointed casually to his notebook, which read, the old man only has one lung, and I did not doubt it. His audible, almost desperate breaths reminded me of my grandfather when he was dying of lung cancer. 
Barrel-chested and ancient, the old man, it seemed to me, might die before he ever reached the podium. My name is Dr. Hyde. I have a first name, of course. So as far as you are concerned, it is Doctor. Your parents pay a great deal of money so that you can attend school here. And I expect that you will offer them some return on their investment by reading what I tell you to read when I tell you to read it and consistently attending this class. And when you are here, you will listen to what I say. Clearly not an easy A. This year, we will be studying three religious traditions. Islam, Christianity, and Buddhism. We will tackle three more traditions next year. And in my classes, I will talk most of the time, and you will listen most of the time. Because you may be smart, but I've been smarter longer. I'm sure some of you do not like lecture classes, but as you probably noted, I'm not as young as I used to be. I would love to spend my remaining breath chatting with you about the finer points of Islamic history, but our time together is short. I must talk, and you must listen. For we are engaged here in the most important pursuit in history. The search for meaning. What is the nature of being a person? What is the best way to go about being a person? How did we come to be, and what will become of us when we are no longer? In short, what are the rules of this game, and how might we best play it? The nature of the labyrinth, I scribbled into my spiral notebook, and the way out of it. This teacher rocked. I hated discussion classes. I hated talking, and I hated listening to everyone else stumble on their words and try to phrase things in the vaguest possible way so they wouldn't sound dumb. And I hated how it was all just a game of trying to figure out what the teacher wanted to hear and then saying it. I'm in class, so teach me. And teach me he did. In those 50 minutes, the old man made me take religion seriously. I'd never been religious, but he told us that religion is important whether or not we believed in one, in the same way that historical events are important whether or not you personally lived through them. And then he assigned us 50 pages of reading for the next day from a book called Religious Studies. That afternoon, I had two classes and two free periods. We had nine 50-minute class periods each day, which means that most everyone had three study periods, except for the colonel who had an extra independent study math class on account of being an extra special genius. The colonel and I had biology together, where I pointed out the other guy who duct taped me the night before. In the top corner of his notebook, the colonel wrote, Longwell Chase, Senior W. Day Warrior, Friends with Sarah, Weird. It took me a minute to remember who Sarah was, the colonel's girlfriend. I spent my free periods in my room trying to read about religion. I learned that myth doesn't mean a lie. It means a traditional story that tells you something about people and their worldview and what they hold sacred. Interesting. I also learned that after the events of the previous night, I was far too tired to care about myths or anything else, so I slept on top of the covers for most of the afternoon until I woke to Alaska singing Wake up, little pudgy! directly into my left ear canal. I held the religion book up close against my chest like a small paperback security blanket. That was terrible, I said. What do I need to do to ensure that never happens to me again? Nothing you can do, she said excitedly. I'm unpredictable. God, don't you hate Dr. Hyde? Don't you? He's so condescending. I sat up and said, I think he's a genius. Partly because I thought it was true and partly because I just felt like disagreeing with her. She sat down on the bed. Do you always sleep in your clothes? Yep. Funny. She said. You weren't wearing much last night. I just glared at her. Come on, Pudge, I'm teasing. You have to be tough here. I didn't know how bad it was, and I'm sorry, and I'll regret it. But you have to be tough. And then she left. That was all she had to say on the subject. She's cute, I thought. 
but you don't need to like a girl who treats you like you're 10. You've already got a mom. 122 days before. After my last class of my first week at Culver Creek, I entered room 43 to an unlikely sight. The dimitive and shirtless colonel hunched over an ironing board attacking a pink button-down shirt. Sweat trickled down his forehead and chest as he ironed with great enthusiasm, his right arm pushing the iron across the length of the shirt with such vigor that his breathing nearly duplicated Dr. Hyde's. I, I have a date, he explained. This is an emergency. He paused to catch his breath. Do you know... Breath. How to iron? I walked over to the pink shirt. It was wrinkled like an old woman who'd spent her youth sunbathing. If only the colonel didn't ball up his every belonging and stuff it into random dresser drawers. I think you just turn it on and press it against the shirt, right? I said. I don't know. I didn't even know we had an iron. We, we don't. It's Takumi's, but Takumi doesn't know how to iron either. And when I asked Alaska, she started yelling, You're not going to impose the patriarchal paradigm on me. Oh God, I need to smoke. I need to smoke, and I can't reek when I see Sarah's parents. Okay, screw it. We're going to smoke in the bathroom with the shower on. The shower has steam. Steam gets rid of wrinkles, right? He said as I followed him into the bathroom. By the way, if you want to smoke inside during the day, just turn on the shower. The smoke follows the steam up the vents. Though this made no scientific sense, it seemed to work. The shower shortage of water pressure and low shower head made it all but useless for showering, but it worked great as a smoke screen. Sadly, it made a poor iron. The colonel tried ironing the shirt once more. I'm just going to push really hard and see if that helps. And finally, put it on wrinkled. He matched the shirt with a blue tie decorated with horizontal lines of little pink flamingos. The one thing my lousy father taught me, the colonel said as his hands nimbly threaded the tie into a perfect knot, was how to tie a tie, which is odd since I can't imagine when he ever had to wear one. Just then, Sarah knocked on the door. I'd seen her once or twice before, but the colonel never introduced me to her and didn't have a chance to that night. Oh my god. Can't you at least press your shirt? She asked, even though the colonel was standing in front of the ironing board. We're going out with my parents. Sarah looked awfully nice in her blue summer dress. Her long, pale blonde hair was pulled up into a twist, with a strand of hair falling down each side of her face. She looked like a movie star. A bitchy one. Look, I did my best. We don't all have maids to do our ironing. Chip, that chip on your shoulder makes you look even shorter. Christ, can we get out the door without fighting? I'm just saying. It's the opera. It's a big deal to my parents. Whatever, let's go. I felt like leaving, but it seemed stupid to hide in the bathroom, and Sarah was standing in the doorway, one hand cocked on her hip, and the other fiddling with her car keys as if to say, let's go. I could wear a tuxedo and your parents would still hate me, he shouted. That's not my fault. You antagonize them. She held up the car keys in front of him. Look, we're going now, or we're not going. Fuck it, I'm not going anywhere with you, the colonel said. Fine. Have a great night. Sarah slammed the door so hard that a sizable biography of Leo Tolstoy, last words, the truth is, I care a great deal, what they, fell off my bookshelf and landed with a thud on our checkered floor like an echo of the slamming door. Ah! He screamed. So that's Sarah, I said. Yes. She seemed nice. The colonel laughed, knelt down next to the mini-fridge, and pulled out a gallon of milk. He opened it, took a swig, winced, half-coughed, and sat down on the couch with the milk between his legs. Is it sour or something? Oh, I should have mentioned that earlier. That isn't milk. It's five parts milk and one part vodka. I call it ambrosia. Drink of the gods. You can barely smell the vodka in the milk, so the eagle can't catch me unless he actually takes a sip. The downside is... That it tastes like sour milk and rubbing alcohol. But it's Friday night, Pudge, and my girlfriend is a bitch. Want some? I think I'll pass. Aside from a few sips of champagne on New Year's under the watchful eye of my parents, I never really drunk any alcohol, and ambrosia didn't seem like the drink with which to start. Outside, I heard the payphone ring. Given the fact that 190 boarders shared five payphones, I was amazed at how infrequently it rang. We weren't supposed to have cell phones, but I noticed that some of the weekday warriors carried them surreptitiously, 
and most non-warriors called their parents, as I did, on a regular basis, so parents only called when their kids forgot. Are you going to get that? The colonel asked me. I didn't feel like being bossed around by him, but I also didn't feel like fighting. Through a buggy twilight, I walked to the payphone, which was drilled into the wall between room 44 and 45. On both sides of the phone, dozens of phone numbers and esoteric notes were written in pen and marker. 205-555-1584, Tommy to airport, 420-773-573-6521, JG Cuffs. Calling the payphone required a great deal of patience. I picked up on about the ninth ring. Can you get Chip for me? Sarah asked. It sounded like she was on a cell phone. Yeah, hold on. I turned, and he was already behind me, as if he knew it would be her. I handed him the receiver and walked back to the room. A minute later, three words made their way to our room through the thick, still air of Alabama at almost midnight. Screw you too! The colonel shouted. Back in the room, he sat down with his ambrosia and told me, She says I ratted out Paul and Maria. That's what the warriors are saying, that I ratted them out. Me. That's why the piss in the shoes. That's why the nearly killing you. Because you live with me and they say I'm a rat. I tried to remember who Paul and Maria were. The names were familiar, but I had heard so many names in the last week, and I couldn't match Paul and Maria with faces. And then I remembered why. I'd never seen them. They got kicked out the year before having committed the trifecta. How long have you been dating her? I asked. Nine months. We never got along. I mean, I didn't even briefly like her. Like, my mom and my dad... My dad would get pissed, and then he would beat the shit out of my mom. And then my dad would be all nice, and they'd have, like, a honeymoon period. But with Sarah, there's never a honeymoon period. God, how could she think I was a rat? I know, I know. Why don't we break up? He ran a hand through his hair, clutching a fistful of it atop his head, and said, I guess I stay with her because she stays with me. And that's not an easy thing to do. I'm a bad boyfriend. She's a bad girlfriend. We deserve each other. But... I can't believe they think that. He said as he walked to the bookshelf and pulled down the almanac. He took a long pull off his ambrosia. God damn weekday warriors. It was probably one of them that ratted out Paul and Maria and then blamed me to cover their tracks. Anyway, it's a good night for staying in. Staying in with Pudge and Ambrosia. I still, I said, wanting to say that I didn't understand how you can kiss someone who believed you were a rat if being a rat was the worst thing in the world. But the colonel cut me off. Not another word about it. You know what the capital of Sierra Leone is? No. Me neither. He said. But I intend to find out. And with that, he stuck his nose in the almanac, and the conversation was over. 110 Days Before Keeping up with my classes proved easier than I'd expected. My general predisposition to spending a lot of time inside reading gave me a distinct advantage over the average Culver Creek student. By the third week of classes, plenty of kids had been sunburned to a burfrito like golden brown from days spent chatting outside in the shadeless dorm circle during free periods. But I was barely pink. I studied. And I listened in class, too. But on that Wednesday morning, when Dr. Hyde started talking about how Buddhists believe that all things are interconnected, I found myself staring out the window. I was looking at the wooded, slow, sloping hill beyond the lake. And from Hyde's classroom, things did seem connected. The trees seemed to clothe the hill, and just as I would never think to notice a particular cotton thread in the magnificently tight orange tank top Alaska wore that day, I couldn't see the trees for the forest. Everything so intricately woven together that it made no sense to think of one tree as independent from that hill. And then I heard my name, and I knew I was in trouble. Mr. Halter, the old man said. Here I am, straining my lungs for your edification. And yet... Something out there seems to have caught your fancy in a way that I have been unable to do. Pray tell, what have you discovered out there? Now I felt my own breath shorten, the whole class watching me, thanking God they weren't me. Dr. Hyde had already done this three times, kicking kids out of class for not paying attention or writing notes to one another. Um, I was just looking outside... At the, uh, at the hill and thinking about, um, the trees and the forest, like you were saying earlier, about the way 
The old man, who obviously did not tolerate vocalized rambling, cut me off. I'm going to ask you to leave class, Mr. Halter, so that you can go out there and discover the relationship between the um trees and the uh forest. And tomorrow, when you're ready to take this class seriously, I will welcome you back. I sat still, my pen resting in my hand, my notebook open, my face flushed, and my jaw jutting out into an underbite. An old trick I had to keep from looking sad or scared. Two rows behind me, I heard a chair move and turned around to see Alaska standing up, slinging her backpack over her arm. I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. You can't just throw him out of class. You drone on and on for an hour every day, and we're not allowed to glance out the window? The old man stared back at Alaska like a bull at a matador, then raised a hand to his sagging face and slowly rubbed the white stubble on his cheek. For fifty minutes a day, five days a week, you abide by my rules, or you fail. The choice is yours. Both of you leave. I stuffed my notebook into my backpack and walked out, humiliated. As the door shut behind me, I felt a tap on my left shoulder. I turned, but there was no one there. Then I turned the other way, and Alaska was smiling at me. The skin between her eyes and temple crinkled into a starburst. The oldest trick in the book, she said. But everybody falls for it. I tried to smile, but I couldn't stop thinking about Dr. Hyde. It was worse than the duct tape incident, because I always knew that the Kevin Richmonds of the world didn't like me. But my teachers had always been card-carrying members of the Miles Halter fan club. I told you he was an asshole, she said. I still think he's a genius. He's right. I wasn't listening. Right. But he didn't need to be a jerk about it. Like, he needs to prove his power by humiliating you? Anyway, she said, The only real geniuses are artists. Yeats, Picasso, Garcia Marquez. Geniuses. Dr. Hyde? Bitter old man. And then she announced we were going to look for four-leaf clovers until class ended, and we can go smoke with the colonel and Takumi. Both of whom, she added, are big-time assholes for not marching out of class right behind us. When Alaska Young is sitting with her legs crossed in a brittle, periodically green clover patch, leaning forward in search of four-leaf clovers, the pale skin of her sizable cleavage clearly visible, it is a plain fact of human physiology that it becomes impossible to join in her clover search. I'd gotten in enough trouble already for looking where I wasn't supposed to, but still. After perhaps two minutes of combing through a clover patch with her long, dirty fingernails, Alaska grabbed the clover with three full-size petals and an undersized runt of a fourth, then looked up at me, barely giving me time to avert my eyes. Even though you were clearly not doing your part in the clover search, perv, she said wryly, I really would give you this clover, except luck is for losers. She pinched the runt petal between the nails of her thumb and finger and plucked it. There, she said to the clover as she dropped it onto the ground. Now you're not a genetic freak anymore. Uh, thanks, I said. The bell rang, and Takumi and the colonel were first at the door. Alaska stared at them. What? Asked the colonel. But she just rolled her eyes and started walking. We followed in silence through the dorm circle and then across the soccer field. We ducked into the woods, following the faint path around the lake until we came to a dirt road. The colonel ran up to Alaska, and they started fighting about something quietly enough that I couldn't hear the words so much as the mutual annoyance. And I finally asked Takumi where we were headed. This road dead ends into the barn, he said. So maybe there, but probably the smoking hole. You'll see. From here, the woods were a totally different creature from Dr. Hyde's classroom. The ground was thick with fallen branches, decaying pine needles, and brambly green bushes. The path wound past pine trees sprouting tall and thin their stubbly needles providing a lace of shade from another sunburned day, and the smaller oak and maple trees, which from Dr. Hyde's classroom had been invisible beneath the more majestic pines, showed hints of an as yet thermally unforeseeable fall. Their still green leaves were beginning to droop. We came to a rickety wooden bridge, just thick plywood laid over a concrete foundation over Culver Creek, the winding rivulet that doubled back over and over again through the outskirts of campus. On the far side of the bridge, there was a tiny path leading down a steep slope. Not even a path, so much as a series of hints. A broken branch here, a path of stump down grass there, that people had come this way before. As we walked down single file, Alaska, the colonel, and Takumi each held back a thick maple branch for one another, 
passing it along until I, last in line, let it snap back into place behind me. And there beneath the bridge, an oasis, a slab of concrete, three feet wide and ten feet long, with blue plastic chairs stolen long ago from some classroom. Cooled by the creek and the shade of the bridge, I felt unhot for the first time in weeks. The colonel dispensed the cigarettes. Takumi passed. The rest of us lit up. He has no right to condescend to us, is all I'm saying. Alaska said, continuing her conversation with the colonel. Hutch is done with staring out the window, and I'm done with going on tirades about it. But he's a terrible teacher, and you won't convince me otherwise. Fine, the colonel said. Just don't make another scene. Christ. You nearly killed the poor old bastard. Seriously, you'll never win by crossing Hyde, Takumi said. He'll eat you alive, shit you out, and piss on his dump. Which, by the way, is what we should be doing to whoever rat on Maria. Has anyone heard anything? It must have been some weekday warrior, Alaska said. But apparently they think it was the colonel, so who knows. Maybe the eagle just got lucky. She was stupid, she got caught, she got expelled, it's over. That's what happens when you're stupid and you get caught. Alaska made an O with her lips, moving her mouth like a goldfish eating, trying, unsuccessfully, to blow smoke rings. Wow, Takumi said. If I ever get kicked out, remind me to even the score myself, since I sure can't count on you. Don't be ridiculous. She responded, not angry so much as dismissive. I don't understand why you're so obsessed with figuring out everything that happens here. Like we have to unravel every mystery. God, it's over. Takumi, you gotta stop stealing other people's problems and get some of your own. Takumi started up again, but Alaska raised her hand as if to swat the conversation away. I said nothing. I hadn't known Maria, and anyway, listening quietly was my general social strategy. Anyway, Alaska said to me, I thought the way he treated you was just awful. I wanted to cry. I just wanted to kiss you and make it better. Shame you didn't, I deadpanned, and they laughed. You're adorable, she said, and I felt the intensity of her eyes on me and looked away nervously. Too bad I love my boyfriend. I stared at the knotted roots of the trees on the creek bank, trying hard not to look like I'd just been called adorable. Takumi couldn't believe it either, and he walked over to me, tussling my hair with his hand, and started rapping to Alaska. Yeah, Pudge is adorable, but you want incorrigible, so Cheek is more endurable, cause he's so damn, damn. I almost had four rhymes on adorable, but all I could think of was unflorable, which isn't even a word. Alaska laughed. <laughs> that made me not mad at you anymore. God, rapping is sexy. Pudge, did you even know that you're in the presence of the sickest MC in Alabama? Um, no. Drop a beat, Colonel Catastrophe. Takumi said, and I laughed at the idea that a guy as short and dorky as the Colonel could have a rap name. The Colonel cupped his hands around his mouth and started making some absurd noises that I suppose were intended to be beats. <coughs> Takumi laughed. Right here by the river, you want me to kick it? If your smoke wasn't possible, I surely lick it. My mind in his old school. Sort of like the ancient Romans. The colonel's beats it's sad, like Arthur Miller's Willie Loman. Sometimes I'm accused of being a showman. I can rhyme fast, and I can rhyme slow, man. He paused, took a breath, and then finished. Like Emily Dickinson, I ain't afraid of slant rhyme. And that's the end of this verse. MC's out on the high. I didn't know slant rhyme from regular rhyme, but I was suitably impressed. We gave Takumi a soft round of applause. Alaska finished her cigarette and flicked it into the river. Why do you smoke so damn fast? I asked. She looked at me and smiled widely, and such a wide smile on her narrow face might have looked goofy were it not for the unimpeachably elegant green in her eyes. She smiled with all the delight of a kid on Christmas morning and said, Y'all smoke to enjoy it. I smoke to die. 109 Days Before Dinner in the cafeteria the next night was meatloaf. One of the rare dishes that didn't arrive deep fried, and perhaps as a result, meatloaf was Maureen's greatest failure. A stringy, gravy soaked concoction that did not much resemble a loaf and did not much taste like meat. Although I'd never ridden in it, Alaska apparently had a car, and she offered to drive the Colonel and me to McDonald's, but the Colonel didn't have any money, and I didn't have much either. What with constantly paying for his extravagant cigarette habit. So instead, the colonel and I reheated two-day-old befritos. Unlike, say, french fries, a microwave befrito lost nothing of its taste, or satisfying crunch. After which, the colonel insisted on attending the creek's first basketball game of the season. Basketball in the fall? I asked the colonel. I don't know much about sports, but isn't that when you play football? The schools in our league are too small to have football teams, so we play basketball in the fall. 
Although, man, the Culver Creek football team would be a thing of beauty. Your scrawny ass could probably start at lineman. Anyway, the basketball games are great. I hated sports. I hated sports, and I hated people who played them, and I hated people who watched them, and I hated people who didn't hate people who watched or played them. In third grade, the very last year that one could play t-ball, my mother wanted me to make friends, so she forced me onto the Orlando Pirates. I made friends alright, with a bunch of kindergartners, which didn't really bolster my social standing with my peers, primarily because I towered over the rest of the players. I only made it onto the t-ball all-star team that year. The kid who beat me, Clay Wurzel, had one arm. I was an unusually tall third grader with two arms, and I got beat out by kindergartner Clay Wurzel. And it wasn't some pity the one-armed kid thing either. Clay Wurzel could flat out hit, or his eyes sometimes struck out, even with the ball sitting on the tee. One of the things that appealed to me most about Culver Creek was that my dad assured me there was no P.E. requirement. There is only one time when I put aside my passionate hatred for the weekday warriors and their country club bullshit, the colonel told me, and that's when they pump up the air conditioning in the gym for a little old-fashioned Culver Creek basketball. You can't miss the first game of the year. As we walked toward the airplane hangar of a gym, which I had seen but never even thought to approach, the colonel explained to me the most important thing about our basketball team. They were not very good. The star of the team, the colonel said, was a senior named Hank Watson, who played power forward despite being five foot eight. Hank's primary claim to campus fame, I already knew, was that he always had weed, and the colonel told me that for four years, Hank started every game without ever once playing sober. He loves weed like Alaska loves sex, the colonel said. This is a man who once constructed a bong using only the barrel of an air rifle, a ripe pear, and an 8x10 glossy photograph of Anna Kornikova. Not the brightest gym in the jewelry shop, but you've got to admire his single-minded dedication to drug abuse. From Hank, the colonel told me it went downhill until you reach Wilson Carbode, the starter center, who was about six feet tall. We're so bad, the colonel said. We don't even have a mascot. I call us the Culver Creek Nothings. So they just suck, I asked. I didn't quite understand the point of watching your terrible team get walloped, though the air conditioning was reason enough for me. Oh, they suck, the colonel replied. But we always beat the shit out of the deaf and blind school. Apparently, basketball wasn't a big priority at the Alabama school for the deaf and blind, and so we usually came out of the season with a single victory. When we arrived, the gym was packed with most every Culver Creek student. I noticed, for instance, the Creek's three goth girls reapplying their eyeliner as they sat on the top row of the gym's bleachers. I'd never attended a school basketball game back home, but I doubted the crowds there were quite so inclusive. Even so, I was surprised when none other than Kevin Richmond sat down on the bleacher directly in front of me while the opposing school's cheerleading team, their unfortunate school colors, were mud brown into hydrated piss yellow, tried to fire up the small visitor section in the crowd. Kevin turned around and stared at the colonel. Like most of the other guy warriors, Kevin dressed preppy, looking like a lawyer who enjoys golfing waiting to happen. And his hair, a blonde mop short on the sides and spiky on top, was always soaked through with so much gel that it looked perennially wet. I didn't hate him like the colonel did, of course, because the colonel hated him on principle. And principled hate is a hell of a lot stronger than, boy, I wish you hadn't mummified me and thrown me into the lake, hate. Still, I tried to stare at him intimidatingly as he looked at the colonel, but it was hard to forget that this guy had seen my skinny ass in nothing but boxers a couple weeks ago. You ratted out Paul and Maya. We got you back. Truce? Kevin asked. I didn't rat them out. Pudge here certainly didn't rat them out, but you brought him in on your fun. Truce? Let me take a poll real quick. The cheerleaders sat down, holding their pom-poms close to their chest, as if praying. Hey, Pudge! The colonel said. What do you think of a truce? It reminds me of when the Germans demanded that the U.S. surrender at the Battle of the Bulge, I said. I guess I'd say to this truce offer what General McAuliffe said to that one. Nuts. Why would you try and kill this guy, Kevin? He's a genius. Nuts to your truce. Come on, dude. I know you ratted them out. We had to defend our friend, and now it's over. Let's end it. He seemed very sincere, perhaps due to the colonel's reputation for pranking. I'll make you a deal. You pick one dead American president. If Pudge doesn't know that guy's last words, truce. 
If he does, you spend the rest of your life lamenting the day you pissed in my shoes. <laughs> That's retarded. All right. No truce. The colonel shot back. Fine. Millard Fillmore. Kevin said. The colonel looked at me hurriedly, his eyes saying, Was that guy a president? I just smiled. When Fillmore was dying, he was super hungry, but his doctor was trying to starve his fever or whatever. Fillmore wouldn't shut up about wanting to eat, though, so finally, the doctor gave him a tiny teaspoon of soup. And all sarcastic, Fillmore said, The nourishment is palatable, and then died. No truce. Kevin rolled his eyes and walked away, and it occurred to me that I could have made up any last words for Millard Fillmore, and Kevin probably would have believed me if I'd used that same tone of voice, the colonel's confidence rubbing off on me. <laughs> that was your first badass moment, the colonel laughed. Now, it's true that I gave you an easy target, but still, well done. Unfortunately for the Culver Creek nothings, we weren't playing the deaf and blind school. We were playing some Christian school from downtown Birmingham. A team stocked of huge gargantuan ape men with thick beards and a strong distaste for turning the other cheek. At the end of the first quarter, 20 to 4, and that's when the fun started. The colonel led all the cheers. Cornbread! He screamed. Chicken! Chicken! The crowd responded. Rice! Peas! And then all together. We got higher SATs! Hip, 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 hooray! The colonel cried. You'll be working for us someday! The opposing team's cheerleaders tried to answer our cheers with, The roof! The roof! The roof is on fire! Hell is in your future if you give in to desire! But we can always do them one better. Buy! Sell! Raid! Barter! You're much bigger, but we are smarter! When the visitors shoot a free throw on most every court in the country, the fans make a lot of noise, screaming and stomping their feet. It doesn't work because players learn to tune out white noise. At Culver Creek, we had a much better strategy. At first, everyone yelled and screamed like in a normal game, but then everyone said, shh, and it was absolute silence. Just as our hated opponent stopped dribbling and prepared for a shot, the colonel stood up and screamed something like, For the love of God, please shave your back hair! Or, I need to be saved! Can you minister to me after your shot? Toward the end of the third quarter, the Christian school coach called a timeout and complained to the ref about the colonel, pointing at him angrily. We were down 46-13. to 13. The colonel stood up. What? You have a problem with me? The coach screamed. You're bothering my players! That's the point, Sherlock! The colonel screamed back. The ref came over and kicked him out of the gym. I followed him. I've gotten thrown out of 37 straight games. He said. Damn. Yeah, once or twice, I've had to go really crazy. I ran onto the court with 11 seconds left once and stole the ball from the other team. It wasn't pretty, but, you know, I have a streak to maintain. The colonel ran ahead of me, gleeful at his ejection, and I jogged after him, trailing in his wake. I wanted to be one of those people who have streaks to maintain, who scorched the ground of their intensity. But for now, at least I knew such people, and they needed me, just like comets need tails. 108 Days Before The next day, Dr. Hyde asked me to stay after class. Standing before him, I realized for the first time how hunched his shoulders were, and he seemed suddenly sad and kind of old. You like this class, don't you? He asked. Yes, sir. You've got a lifetime to mull over the Buddhist understanding of interconnectedness. He spoke every sentence as if he'd written it down, memorized it, and was now reciting it. But while you're looking out the window, you miss the chance to explore the equally interesting Buddhist belief in being present for every facet of your daily life. Of being truly present. Be present in this glass. And then, when it's over, be present out there, he said, nodding toward the lake and beyond. Yes, sir. 101 Days Before On the first morning of October, I knew something was wrong as soon as I woke up enough to turn off the alarm clock. The bed didn't smell right, and I didn't feel right. It took me a groggy minute before I realized I felt cold. Well, at the very least, the small fan clipped to my bunk seemed suddenly unnecessary. It's cold! I shouted. God, what time is it? I heard above me. 8.04, I said. The colonel, who didn't have an alarm clock, but almost always woke up to take a shower before mine went off, 
swung his short legs over the side of the bed, jumped down, and dashed to his dresser. I suppose I missed my window of opportunity to shower, he said as he put on a green Culver Creek basketball t-shirt and a pair of shorts. Oh well. There's always tomorrow. And it's not cold, it's probably 80. Grateful to have slept fully dressed, I just put on shoes, and the colonel and I jogged to the classrooms. I slid into my seat with 20 seconds to spare. Halfway through class, Madame O'Malley turned around to write something in French on the blackboard, and Alaska passed me a note. Nice bedhead. Study at McDonald's for lunch? Our first significant pre-calc test was only two days away, so Alaska grabbed the six pre-calc kids she did not consider weekday warriors and piled us into her tiny blue two-door. By happy coincidence, a cute sophomore named Laura ended up sitting on my lap. Laura had been born in Russia or someplace, and she spoke with a slight accent. Since we were only four layers of clothes from doing it, I took the opportunity to introduce myself. I know who you are. She smiled. You're Alaska's friend from Florida. Yep. Get ready for a lot of dumb questions, because I suck at pre-calc, I said. She started to answer, but then she was thrown back against me as Alaska shot out of the parking lot. Kids, meet Blue Citrus. So named because she's a lemon, Alaska said. Blue Citrus, meet the kids. If you can find them, you might want to fasten your seatbelts. Pudge, you might want to serve as a seatbelt for Lara. What the car lacked in speed, Alaska made up for by refusing to move her foot from the accelerator. Damn the consequences. Before we even got off campus, Laura was lurching helplessly whenever Alaska took hard turns, so I took Alaska's advice and wrapped my arms around Laura's waist. Thanks, she said, almost inaudibly. After a fast, if reckless, three miles to McDonald's, we ordered seven large fries a share and then went outside and sat on the lawn. We sat in a circle around the trays of fries, and Alaska taught class, smoking while she ate. Like any good teacher, she tolerated little dissension. She smoked and talked and ate for an hour without stopping, and I scribbled in my notebook as the muddy waters of tangents and cosines began to clarify. But not everyone was so fortunate. As Alaska zipped through something obvious about linear equations, stoner slash baller Hank Waltzen said, Wait, wait. I don't get it. That's because you have eight functioning brain cells. The studies show that marijuana is better for your health than those cigarettes, Hank said. Alaska swallowed a mouthful of fries, took a drag on her cigarette, and blew smoke at Hank. I may die young, she said, but at least I'll die smart. Now, back to tangents. 100 Days Before Not to ask the obvious question, but why Alaska? I asked. I'd just gotten my pre-calc test back, and I was awash with admiration for Alaska, since her tutoring had paved my way to a B+. She and I sat alone in a TV lounge watching MTV on a dreary, cloudy Saturday. Furnished with couches left behind by previous generations of Culver Creek students, the TV room had the musty air of dust and mildew, and perhaps for that reason was almost perennially unoccupied. Alaska took a sip of Mountain Dew and grabbed my hand in hers. Always comes up eventually. Alright, so my mom was something of a hippie when I was a kid. You know, wore oversized sweaters, she knitted herself, smoked a lot of pot, etc. And my dad was a real Republican type. And so when I was born, my mom wanted to name me Harmony Springs Young, and my dad wanted to name me Mary Frances Young. As she talked, she bobbed her head back and forth to the MTV music, even though the song was the kind of manufactured pop ballad she professed to hate. So instead of naming me Harmony or Mary, they agreed to let me decide. So when I was little, they called me Mary. I mean, they called me Sweetie or whatever, but like on school forms and stuff, they wrote Mary Young. And then on my seventh birthday, my present was that I got to pick my name. Cool, huh? So I spent the whole day looking at my dad's globe for a really cool name. And so my first choice was Chad, like the country in Africa. But then my dad said that was a boy's name. So I picked Alaska. I wish my parents would let me pick my name. But they went ahead and picked the only name firstborn male halters have had for a century. But why Alaska? I asked her. She smiled with the right side of her mouth. Well, later, I found out what it means. It's from an Aleut word, alieska. It means that which the sea breaks against, and I love that. But at the time, I just saw Alaska up there, and it was big, just like I wanted to be, and it was damn far away from Vine Station, Alabama, just like I wanted to be. I laughed. And now you're all grown up and fairly far away from home, I said, smiling. 
So, congratulations. She stopped the head bobbing and let go of my, unfortunately sweaty, hand. Getting out isn't that easy. She said seriously, her eyes on mine like I knew the way out and wouldn't tell her. And then she seemed to switch conversational horses in midstream. Like, after college, know what I want to do? Teach disabled kids. I'm a good teacher, right? Shit, if I can teach you pre-calc, I can teach anybody. Like, maybe kids with autism. She talked softly and thoughtfully, like she was telling me a secret. And I leaned in toward her, suddenly overwhelmed the feeling that we must kiss. That we ought to kiss right now on the dusty orange couch with its cigarette burns and its decades of collected dust. And I would have. I would have kept leaning toward her until it became necessary to tilt my face so as to miss her ski slope nose. And I would have felt the shock of her so soft lips. I would have. But then she snapped out of it. No. She said, and I couldn't tell at first whether she was reading my kiss-obsessed mind or responding to herself out loud. She turned away from me and softly, maybe to herself, said, Jesus, I'm not going to be one of those people who sits around talking about what they're going to do. I'm just going to do it. Imagining the future is a kind of nostalgia. Huh? I asked. You spend your whole life stuck in the labyrinth, thinking about how you'll escape it one day and how awesome it'll be. And imagining the future keeps you going, but you never do it. You just use the future to escape the present. I guess that made sense. I had imagined that Life of the Creek would be a bit more exciting than it was. In reality, there had been more homework than adventure. But if I hadn't imagined it, I would never have gotten to the creek at all. She turned back to the TV, a commercial for a car now, and made a joke about Blue Citrus needing its own car commercial. Mimicking the deep voice passion of commercial voiceovers, she said, It's small, it's slow, and it's shitty, but it runs. Sometimes. Blue Citrus, see your local used car dealer. But I wanted to talk more about her and Vine Station in the future. Sometimes I don't get you, I said. She didn't even glance at me. She just smiled toward the television and said, You never get me. That's the whole point. 99 Days Before I spent most of the next day lying in bed, immersed in the miserably uninteresting fictional world of Ethan Frome, while the colonel sat at his desk, unraveling the secrets of differential equations or something. Although we tried to ration our smoke breaks amid the shower's steam, we ran out of cigarettes before dark, necessitating a trip to Alaska's room. She lay on the floor, holding a book over her head. Let's go smoke, he said. You're out of cigarettes, aren't you? She asked without looking up. Well, yes. Got five bucks? She asked. Nope. Pudge? She asked. Yeah, all right. I fished a five out of my pocket, and Alaska handed me a pack of 20 Marlboro Lights. I knew I'd smoke maybe five of them, but so long as I subsided the colonel's smoking, he couldn't really attack me for being another rich kid. A weekday warrior who just didn't happen to live in Birmingham. We grabbed Takumi and walked down to the lake, hiding behind a few trees, laughing. The colonel blew smoke rings, and Takumi called them pretentious while Alaska followed the smoke rings with her fingers, stabbing at them like a kid trying to pop bubbles. And then we heard a branch break. It might have been a deer, but the colonel busted out anyway. A voice directly behind us said, Don't run, chipper. And the colonel stopped, turned around, and returned to us sheepishly. The eagle walked toward us slowly, his lips pursed in disgust. He wore a white shirt and a black tie, like always. He gave each of us, in turn, the look of doom. Y'all smell like a North Carolina tobacco field in a wildfire, he said. We stood silent. I felt disproportionately terrible, like I'd just been caught fleeing the scene of a murder. Would he call my parents? I'll see you in jury tomorrow at five, he announced, and then walked away. Alaska crouched down, picked up the cigarette she had thrown away, and started smoking it again. The eagle wheeled around his sixth sense, detecting insubordination to authority figures. Alaska dropped the cigarette and stepped on it. The eagle shook his head, and even though he must have been crazy mad, I swear to God he smiled. He loves me, Alaska told me as we walked back to the dorm circle. He loves y'all too. He just loves the school more. That's the thing. He thinks busting us is good for the school and good for us. It's the eternal struggle, Pudge. The good versus the naughty. You're awfully philosophical for a girl that just got busted, I told her. Sometimes you lose a battle, but mischief always wins the war. 98 Days Before One of the unique things about Culver Creek was the jury. Every semester, the faculty elected 12 students, three from each class, to serve on the jury. The jury meted out punishment for non-expellable offenses, for everything from staying out past curfew to smoking. Usually, it was smoking or being in a girl's room after seven. 
So you went to the jury, you made your case, and they punished you. The eagle served as the judge, and he had the right to overturn the jury's verdict, just like the real American court system, but he almost never did. I made my way to classroom four right after my last class, 40 minutes early, just to be safe. I sat in the hall with my back against the wall and read my American history textbook. Kind of remedial reading for me, to be honest. Until Alaska showed up and sat down next to me. She was chewing on her bottom lip, and I asked her whether she was nervous. Well, yeah. Listen, just sit tight and don't talk. She told me. You don't need to be nervous, but this is the seventh time I've been caught smoking. I just don't want... Whatever. I don't want to upset my dad. Does your mom smoke or something? I asked. Not anymore. Alaska said. It's fine. You'll be fine. I didn't start to worry until it got to be 4.50 and the colonel and Takumi were still unaccounted for. The members of the jury filed in one by one, walking past us without any eye contact, which made me feel worse. I counted all 12 by 4.56, plus the eagle. At 4.58, the colonel and Takumi rounded the corner toward the classrooms. I never saw anything like it. Takumi wore a starched white shirt with a red tie with a black paisley print. The colonel wore his wrinkled pink button-down and flamingo tie. They walked in step, heads up and shoulders back, like some kind of action movie heroes. I heard Alaska sigh. The colonel's doing his Napoleon walk. It's all good, the colonel told me. Just don't say anything. We walked in, two of us wearing ties and two of us wearing ratty t-shirts, and the eagle banged an honest-to-god gavel against the podium in front of him. The jury sat in a line behind a rectangular table. At the front of the room, by the blackboard, were four chairs. We sat down, and the colonel explained exactly what happened. Alaska and I were smoking down by the lake. We usually go off campus, but we forgot. We're sorry. It won't happen again. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew my job. Sit tight and shut up. One of the kids looked at Takumi and asked, What about you and Halter? We were keeping them company, Takumi said calmly. The kid turned to the eagle then and asked, Did you see anyone smoking? I only saw Alaska, but Chip ran away, which struck me as cowardly, as does Miles and Takumi's off shucks routine, the eagle said, giving me the look of doom. I didn't want to look guilty, but I couldn't hold his stare, so I just looked down at my hands. The colonel gritted his teeth, like it pained him to lie. It is the truth, sir. The eagle asked if any of us wanted to say anything, and then asked if there were any more questions, and then sent us outside. What the hell was that? I asked Akumi when we got outside. Just sit tight, Pudge. Why have Alaska confessed when she'd already been in trouble so many times? Why the colonel, who literally couldn't afford to get in serious trouble? Why not me? I'd never been busted for anything. I had the least to lose. After a couple minutes, the eagle came out and motioned for us to come back inside. Alaska and Chip, a member of the jury said. You get ten work hours, doing dishes in the cafeteria, and you're both officially one problem away from a phone call home. Talk to me and Miles. There's nothing in the rules about watching someone smoke. But the jury will remember your story if you break the rules again. Fair? <sighs> Fair. Alaska said quickly, obviously relieved. On my way out, the eagle spun me around. Don't abuse your privileges at this school, young man, or you will regret it. I nodded. 87 Days Before Our triple and a half date started off well enough. I was in Alaska's room, for the sake of getting me a girlfriend. She'd agreed to iron a green button-down shirt for me when Jake showed up. With blonde hair to his shoulders, dark stubble on his cheeks, and the kind of faux ruggedness that gets you a career as a catalog model, Jake was every bit as good-looking as you'd expect Alaska's boyfriend to be. She jumped onto him and wrapped her legs around him. God forbid anyone ever does that to me, I thought. I'll fall over. I'd heard Alaska talk about kissing, but I'd never seen her kiss until then. As he held her by her waist, she leaned forward, her pouty lips parted, her head just slightly tilted, and enveloped his mouth with such passion that I felt I should look away, but couldn't. A good while later, she untangled herself from Jake and introduced me. This is Pudge, she said. Jake and I shook hands. I've heard a lot about you. He spoke with a slight southern accent, one of the few I'd heard outside of McDonald's. I hope her date works out tonight. Because I wouldn't want you stealing Alaska out from under me. God, you're so adorable. Alaska said before I can answer, kissing him again. I'm sorry. She laughed. I just can't seem to stop kissing my boyfriend. I put on my freshly starched green shirt and the three of us gathered up the Colonel, Sarah, Laura, and Takumi, and then walked to the gym to watch the Culver Creek Nothings take on Hardsden Academy, 
a private day school in Mountain Brook, Birmingham's richest suburb. The colonel's hatred for Hard's Den burned with the fire of a thousand suns. The only thing I hate more than rich people, he told me as he walked to the gym, is stupid people. And all the kids at Harsden are rich, and they're all too stupid to get into the creek. Since we were supposed to be on a date and all, I thought I'd sit next to Laura at the game. But as I tried to walk past a seated Alaska on my way to Laura, Alaska shot me a look and patted the empty spot next to her on the bleachers. I'm not allowed to sit next to my date? I asked. Pudge, one of us has been a girl her whole life. The other of us has never gotten to second base. If I were you, I'd sit down, look cute, and be your pleasantly aloof self. Okay, whatever you say, Jake said. That's pretty much my strategy for pleasing Alaska. Aww. She said. So sweet. Pudge, did I tell you that Jake is recording an album with his band? They're fantastic. They're like Radiohead meets the Flaming Lips. Did I tell you I came up with their name, Hickman Territory? And then, realizing she was being silly, Did I tell you that Jake is hung like a horse and a beautiful, sensual lover? Baby. <sighs> Jesus. Jake smiled. Not in front of the kids. I wanted to hate Jake, of course, but as I watched them together, smiling and fumbling all over each other, I didn't hate him. I wanted to be him, sure, but I tried to remember I was ostensibly on a date with someone else. Harzen Academy star player was a six foot seven Goliath named Travis Eastman that everyone, even his mother, I suspect, called the Beast. The first time the Beast got to the free throw line, the Colonel could not help himself from swearing while he taunted, You owe everything to your daddy, you stupid redneck bastard! The Beast turned around and glared, and the Colonel almost got kicked out after the first free throw, but he smiled at the ref and said, Sorry, I want to stay around for a good part of this one, he said to me. At the start of the second half, with the creek down by a surprisingly slim margin of 24 points and the beast at the foul line, the colonel looked at Takumi and said, It's time. Takumi and the colonel stood up as the crowd went, Shh. I didn't know if this is the best time to tell you this. The colonel shouted at the beast. But Takumi here hooked up with your girlfriend just before the game. That made everyone laugh, except the beast, who turned from the free throw line and walked calmly with the ball towards us. I think we run now, Takumi said. I haven't gotten kicked out yet, the colonel answered. Later, Takumi said. I don't know whether it was the general anxiety of being on a date, albeit one with my would-be date sitting five people away from me, or the specific anxiety of having the beast stare in my direction, but for some reason, I took off running after Takumi. I thought we were in the clear as we began to round the corner of the bleachers, but then I saw, out of the corner of my eye, a cylindrical orange object getting bigger and bigger like a fast approaching sun. I thought, I think that is going to hit me. I thought I should duck. But in the time between when something gets thought and when it gets done, the ball hit me square across the side of the face. I fell, the back of my head slamming against the gym floor. I then stood up immediately, as if unhurt, and left the gym. Pride had gotten me off the floor of the gym, but as soon as I was outside, I sat down. I am concussed. I announced, entirely sure of my self-diagnosis. You're fine, Takumi said as he jogged back toward me. Let's get out of here before we're killed. I'm sorry, I said, but I can't get up. I suffered a mild concussion. Laura ran out and sat down next to me. Are you okay? I am concussed, I said. Takumi sat down with me and looked me in the eye. Do you know what happened to you? The beast got me. Do you know where you are? I'm on a triple and a half date. You're fine. Takumi said. Let's go. And then I leaned forward and threw up onto Laura's pants. I can't say why I didn't lean backward or to the side. I leaned forward and aimed my mouth toward her jeans. A nice, but flattering pair of jeans. The kind of pants a girl wears when she wants to look nice, but not look like she is trying to look nice. And I threw up all over them. Mostly peanut butter, but also clearly some corn. Oh! She said, surprised and slightly horrified. Oh, God, I said. I'm so sorry. I think you might have a concussion, Takumi said, as if the idea had never been suggested. I am suffering from the nausea and dizziness typically associated with a mild concussion, I recited. While Takumi went to get the eagle and Laura changed pants, I lay on the concrete sidewalk. The eagle came back with the school nurse who diagnosed me with, get this, a concussion. And then Takumi drove me to the hospital with Laura riding shotgun. Apparently, I lay in the back and slowly repeated the words, The symptoms generally associated with 
concussion. So I spent my day at the hospital with Laura and Takumi. The doctor told me to go home and sleep a lot, but to make sure and have someone wake me up every four hours or so. I vaguely remember Laura standing in the doorway, the room dark and the outside dark and everything mild and uncomfortable but sort of spinny, the world pulsing as if from a heavy bass beat, and I vaguely remember Laura smiling at me from the doorway, the glittering ambiguity of a girl's smile, which seems to promise an answer to the question but never gives it. The question. The one we've all been asking since girls stopped being gross. The question is too simple to be uncomplicated. Does she like me? Or like me? And then I fell deeply, endlessly asleep, and slept until three in the morning when the colonel woke me up. She dumped me. He said, I am concussed. I responded. So I heard. Hence my waking you up. Video game? Okay, but keep it on mute. My head hurts. Yeah, heard you puked on Lara? Very suave. Dumped? I asked, getting up. Yeah. Sarah told Jake that I had a hard-on for Alaska. Those words. In that order. And I was like, well, I don't have a hard-on for anything at this moment. You can check if you like. And Sarah thought I was being too glib, I suppose, because then she said she knew for a fact I'd hooked up with Alaska, which, incidentally, is ridiculous. I don't cheat he said and finally the game finished loading and i half listened as i drove a stock car in circles around the silent track in talladega the circles nauseated me but i kept at it so alaska went ballistic basically he affected alaska's voice then making it more shrill and headache inducing than it actually was no woman should ever lie about another woman you violated the sacred covenant between women how will stabbing one another in the back help women to rise above patriarchal oppression And so on. And then Jake came to Alaska's defense, saying that she would never cheat because she loved him. And then I was like, don't worry about Sarah. She just likes bullying people. And then Sarah asked me why I never stood up for her. And somewhere in there, I called her a crazy bitch, which didn't go over particularly well. And then the waitress asked us to leave. And so we were standing in the parking lot. And she said, I've had enough. And I just stared at her. And she said, our relationship is over. He stopped talking, then, our relationship is over? I repeated. I felt very spacey and thought it was just best to repeat the last phrase of whatever the colonel said so he can keep talking. Yeah. So that's it. You know what's lame, Pudge? I really care about her. I mean, we were hopeless, badly matched, but still, I mean... I said I loved her. I lost my virginity to her. You lost your virginity to her? Yeah. Yeah, I never told you that. She's the only girl I've slept with. I don't know. Even though we fought like 94% of the time, I'm really sad. You're really sad? Sadder than I thought I'd be anyway. I mean, I knew it was inevitable. We haven't had a pleasant moment this whole year. Like, ever since I got here, I mean, we were just on each other relentlessly. I should have been nicer to her. I don't know. It's sad. It is sad, I repeated. I mean, it's stupid to miss someone you didn't even get along with, but I don't know. It was nice. You know, having someone you could always fight with. Fighting, I said. And then confused, barely able to drive, I added, it was nice. Right. I don't know what I'll do now. I mean, it was nice to have her. I'm a mad guy, Pudge. What do I do with that? You can fight with me, I said. I put my controller down and leaned back on the foam couch and was asleep. As I drifted off, I heard the colonel say, I can't be mad at you, you harmless skinny bastard. 84 Days Before Three days later, the rain began. My head still hurt and the sizable knot above my left temple looked, the colonel thought, like a miniaturized topographical map of Macedonia, which I had not previously known was a place, let alone a country. And as the colonel and I walked over the parched, half-dead grass that Monday, I said, I suppose we can use some rain. And the colonel looked up at the low clouds coming in fast and threatening, and then he said, Well, use it or not, we're sure as shit going to get some. And we sure as shit did. Twenty minutes into French class, Madame O'Malley was conjugating the verb to believe in the subjunctive. Que je crois. Que tu crois. Que ou qu'elle croit. She said it over and over, like it wasn't a verb so much as a Buddhist mantra. Ku je crois, ku tu crois, ku ou 
Kelkra. What a funny thing to say over and over again. I would believe, you would believe, he or she would believe. Believe what? I thought. And right then, the rain came. It came all at once and in a furious torrent, like God was mad and wanted to flood us out. Day after day, night after night, it rained. It rained so that I couldn't see across the dorm circle, so that the lake swelled up and lapped against the Adirondack swing, swallowing half of the fake beach. By the third day, I abandoned my umbrella entirely and walked around in a perpetual state of wetness. Everything at the cafeteria tasted like the minor acid of rainwater, and everything stank of mildew, and showers became ludicrously inappropriate because the whole goddamn world had better water pressure than the showers. And the rain made hermits of us all. The colonel spent every not-in-class moment sitting on the couch, reading the almanac and playing video games, and I wasn't sure whether he wanted to talk or whether he just wanted to sit on the white foam and drink his ambrosia in peace. After the disaster that was our date, I felt it best not to speak to Laura under any circumstances, lest I suffer a concussion and or an attack of puking, even though she told me in a pre-calc the next day that it was no big deal. And I saw Alaska only in class and could never talk to her, because she came to every class late and left the moment the bell rang before I could even cap my pen and close my notebook. On the fifth evening of the rain, I walked into the cafeteria fully prepared to go back to my room and eat a reheated bufrito for dinner if Alaska and or Takumi weren't eating. I knew full well the colonel was in room 43, dining on milk and vodka. But I stayed, because I saw Alaska sitting alone, her back to a rain-streaked window. I grabbed a heaping plate of fried okra and sat down next to her. God, it's like it'll never end, I said, referring to the rain. Indeed, she said. Her wet hair hung from her head and mostly covered her face. I ate some. She ate some. Uh, how, how have you been? I finally asked. I'm not really up for answering any questions that start with how, when, where, why, or what. What's wrong? I asked. That's a what. I'm not doing what's right now. All right, I should go. She pursed her lips and exhaled slowly, like the way the colonel blew out smoke. What did- Then I stopped myself and reworded. Did I do something? I asked. She gathered her tray and stood up before answering. Of course not, sweetie. Her sweetie felt condescending, not romantic, like a boy enduring his first biblical rainstorm couldn't possibly understand her problems, whatever they were. It took a sincere effort not to roll my eyes at her, though she wouldn't have even noticed as she walked out of the cafeteria with her hair dripping over her face. 76 Days Before I feel better, the colonel told me on the ninth day of the rainstorm as he sat down next to me in religion class. I had an epiphany. Do you remember that night when she came to the room and was a complete and total bitch? Yeah, the opera, the flamingo tie. Right. What about it? I asked. The colonel pulled out a spiral notebook, the top half of which was soaking wet, and slowly pulled the pages apart until he found his place. That was the epiphany. She's a complete and total bitch. Hyde hobbled in, leaning heavily on a black cane. As he made his way toward his chair, he dryly noted, My trick knee is warning me that we might have some rain. So prepare yourselves. He stood in front of the chair, leaned back cautiously, grabbed it with both hands, and collapsed into the chair with a series of quick, shallow breaths, like a woman in labor. Although it isn't due for more than two months, you'll be receiving your paper topic for this semester today. Now I'm quite sure that you've all read the syllabus for this class with such frequency and seriousness that by now you've committed it to memory. He smirked. But a reminder, this paper is 50% of your grade. I encourage you to take it seriously. Now, about this Jesus fellow. Hyde talked about the Gospel of Mark, which I hadn't read until the day before, although I was a Christian. I guess I'd been to church, uh, like, four times. Which is more frequently than I'd been to a mosque or a synagogue. He told us that in the first century, around the time of Jesus, some of the Roman coins had a picture of the Emperor Augustus on them, and that beneath his picture were inscribed the words, Filius Dei, the Son of God. We are speaking of a time... He said, in which God had sons. It was not so unusual to be a son of God. The miracle, at least at that time and in that place, 
was that Jesus was a peasant, a Jew, a nobody in an empire ruled exclusively by somebodies. Was the son of that God the all-powerful God of Abraham and Moses? That God's son was not an emperor, not even a trained rabbi, a peasant and a Jew, a nobody like you. While the Buddha was special because he abandoned his wealth and noble birth to seek enlightenment, Jesus was special because he lacked wealth and noble birth, but inherited the ultimate nobility. King of kings. Glass over. You can pick up a copy of your final exam on the way out. Stay dry. It wasn't until I stood up to leave that I noticed Alaska had skipped class. How could she skip the only class worth attending? I grabbed a copy of the final for her. The final exam. What is the most important question human beings must answer? Choose your question wisely and then examine how Islam, Buddhism, and Christianity attempt to answer it. Hope the poor bastard lives the rest of the school year, the colonel said as we jogged home through the rain. Because I'm sure starting to enjoy that class. What's your most important question? After 30 seconds of running, I was already winded. What happens to us when we die? Christ, Pudge. If you don't stop running, you're going to find out. He slowed to a walk. My question is, why do good people get rotten lots in life? Holy shit, is that Alaska? She was running at us at full speed, and she was screaming, but I couldn't hear her over the pounding rain until she was so close up to us that I could see her spit flying. The fuckers fly in my room. They ruin like a hundred of my books. Goddamn pissant weekday warrior shit. Colonel, they poked a hole in the gutter and connected a plastic tube from the gutter down through my back window into my room. The whole place is soaking wet. My copy of the General in his labyrinth is absolutely ruined. That's pretty good, the colonel said, like an artist admiring another's work. Hey! She shouted. Sorry, don't worry, dude, he said. God will punish the wicked. And before he does, we will. 67 Days Before So this is how Noah felt. You wake up one morning and God has forgiven you, and you walk around squinting all day because you've forgotten how sunlight feels warm and rough against your skin, like a kiss on the cheek from your dad. And the whole world is brighter and cleaner than ever before, like central Alabama has been put in the washing machine for two weeks and cleaned with extra super strength detergent, with color brightener, and now the grass is greener, and the burritos are crunchier. I stayed by the classrooms that afternoon, lying on my stomach in the newly dry grass and reading for American history. The Civil War, or as it was known around these parts, the war between the states. To me, it was the war that spawned a thousand good last words. Like General Albert Sidney Johnston, who, when asked if he was injured, answered, Yes, and I fear seriously. Or Robert E. Lee, who many years after the war in a dying delirium announced, Strike the tent! I was mulling over why the Confederate generals had better last words than the Union ones. Ulysses S. Grant's last word, water, was pretty lame. When I noticed a shadow blocking me from the sun, it had been some time since I'd seen a shadow, and it startled me a bit. I looked up. I brought you a snack, Takumi said, dropping an oatmeal cream pie onto my book. Very nutritious, I smiled. You've got your oats. You've got your meal. You've got your cream. It's a fucking food pyramid. Hell yeah, it is. And then I didn't know what to say. Takumi knew a lot about hip-hop. I knew a lot about last words and video games. Finally, I said... I can't believe those guys flooded Alaska's room. Yeah, Takumi said, not looking at me. Well, they had their reasons. You have to understand that with like everybody, even the weekday warriors, Alaska is famous for pranking. I mean, last year, we put a Volkswagen Beetle in the library. So if they have a reason to try and one-up her, they'll try. And that's pretty ingenious, to divert water from the gutter to her room. I mean, I don't want to admire it. I laughed. (laughs) Yeah, that will be tough to top. I unwrapped the cream pie and bit into it. (sighs) Hundreds of delicious calories per bite. She'll think of something. He said. Pudge? He said. Hmm, Pudge, you need a cigarette. 
Let's go for a walk. I felt nervous, as I invariably do when someone says my name twice with a hmm in between. But I got up, leaving my books behind, and walked toward the smoking hole. But as soon as we got to the edge of the woods, Takumi turned away from the dirt road. Not sure the hole is safe, he said. Not safe, I thought. It's the safest place to smoke a cigarette in the known universe. But I just followed him through the thick brush, weaving through pine trees and threatening chest-high brambly bushes. After a while, he just sat down. I cut my hand around my lighter to protect the flame from the slight breeze and lit up. Alaska ratted out Mario, he said. So the eagle might know about the smoking hole, too. I don't know. I've never seen him down that way. But who knows what she told him. Wait, how do you know? I asked, dubious. Well, for one thing, I figured it out. And for another, Alaska admitted it. She told me at least part of the truth. That right at the end of school last year, she tried to sneak off campus one night after lights out to go visit Jake and then got busted. She said she was careful, no headlights or anything, but the eagle caught her and she had a bottle of wine in her car, so she was fucked. And the eagle took her into his house and gave her the same offer he gives to everyone when they get fatally busted. Either tell me everything you know or go to your room and pack up your stuff. So Alaska broke and told him that Maria and Paul were drunk and in her room right then. And then she told him God knows what else. And so the eagle let her go. Because he needs rats to do his job. She was smart, really, to rat on one of her friends. Because no one ever thinks to blame the friends. That's why the colonel is so sure it was Kevin and his boys. I didn't believe it could be Alaska either. Until I figured out she was the only person on campus who could have known what Maria was doing. I suspected Paul's roommate, Longwell, one of the guys who pulled the armless mermaid bit on you. Turns out he was at home that night. His aunt had died. I checked the obit in the paper. Hollis Burness Chase. Hell of a name for a woman. So, the colonel doesn't know? I asked, stunned. I put out my cigarette, even though I wasn't quite finished, because I felt spooked. I never suspected Alaska could be disloyal. Moody, yes, but not a rat. No, and he can't know, because he'll go crazy and get her expelled. The colonel takes this honor and loyalty shit pretty seriously, if you haven't noticed. I've noticed. Takumi shook his head, his hands pushing aside leaves to dig into the still wet dirt beneath. I just don't get why she'd be so afraid of getting expelled. I'd hate to get expelled. But you have to take your lumps. I don't get it. Well, she obviously doesn't like home. True. She only goes home over Christmas in the summer, when Jake is there. But whatever. I don't like home either. But I'd never give the eagle the satisfaction. Takumi picked up a twig and dug it into the soft red dirt. Listen, Pudge. I don't know what kind of prank Alaska and the Colonel are going to come up with to end this. But I'm sure we'll both be involved. I'm telling you all this so you can know what you're getting into. Because if you get caught, you had better take it. I thought of Florida, of my school friends, and realized for the first time how much I would miss the creek if I ever had to leave it. I stared down at Takumi's twig sticking erect out of the mud and said, I swear to God, I won't rat. I finally understood that day at the jury. Alaska wanted to show us that we could trust her. Survival at Culver Creek meant loyalty. And she had ignored that. But then she'd shown me the way. She and the colonel had taken the fall for me to show me how it was done. So I would know what to do when the time came. 58 Days Before About a week later, I woke up at 6.30. 6.30 on a Saturday. To the sweet melody of decapitation. Automatic gunfire blasted out above the menacing, bass-heavy background music of the video game. I rolled over and saw Alaska pulling the controller up and to the right, as if that would help her escape certain death. I had the same bad habit. Can you at least mute it? Pudge. She said, faux condescending. The sound is an integral part of the artistic experience of this video game. Muting decapitation would be like reading only every other word of Jane Eyre. The colonel woke up about a half an hour ago. He seems a little annoyed, so I told him to go sleep in my room. Maybe I'll join him, I said groggily. Rather than answering my question, she remarked, So I heard Takomi told you. Yeah, I ratted out Maria, and I'm sorry, and I'll never do it again. 
In other news, are you staying here for Thanksgiving? Because I am. I rolled back toward the wall and pulled the comforter over my head. I didn't know whether to trust Alaska, and I'd certainly had enough of her unpredictability. Cold one day, sweet the next, irresistibly flirty one moment, resistibly obnoxious the next. I preferred the colonel. At least when he was cranky, he had a reason. In a testament to the power of fatigue, I managed to fall asleep quickly, convinced that the shrieking of dying monsters and Alaska's delighted squeals upon killing them were nothing more than a pleasant soundtrack by which to dream. I woke up half an hour later when she sat down on my bed, her butt against my hip. Her underwear, her jeans, the comforter, my corduroys, and my boxers between us, I thought. Five layers, and yet I felt it, the nervous warmth of touching. A pale reflection of the fireworks of one mouth on another, but a reflection nonetheless. And in the almostness of the moment, I cared at least enough. I wasn't sure whether I liked her, and I doubted whether I could trust her, but I cared at least enough to try to find out. Her on my bed, wide green eyes staring down at me, the enduring mystery of her sly, almost smirking smile. Five layers between us. She continued, as if I hadn't been asleep. Jake has to study. So, he doesn't want me in Nashville. Says he can't pay attention to musicology while staring at me. I said I would wear a burqa, but he wasn't convinced. So, I'm staying here. I'm sorry, I said. Oh, don't be. I'll have loads to do. There's a prank to plan. But I was thinking you should stay here, too. In fact, I have composed a list. A list? She reached into her pocket and pulled out a heavily folded piece of notebook paper and began to read. Why Pudge should stay at the creek for Thanksgiving. A list by Alaska Young. 1. Because he is a very conscientious student, Pudge has been deprived of many wonderful Colville Creek experiences, including, but not limited to, A. Drinking wine with me in the woods, and B. Getting up early on a Saturday to eat breakfast at Mick and Edible, and then driving through the greater Birmingham area, smoking cigarettes, and talking about how pathetically boring the greater Birmingham area is. And also C. Going out late at night, and lying in the dewy soccer field and reading a Kurt Vonnegut book by Moonlight. 2. Although she certainly does not excel at endeavors such as teaching the French language, Madame O'Malley makes a mean stuffing, and she invites all the students who stay on campus to Thanksgiving dinner, which is usually just me and the South Korean exchange student, but whatever. Pudge would be welcome. 3. I don't really have a 3, but 1 and 2 were awfully good. One and two appealed to me, certainly, but mostly I like the idea of just her and just me on campus. I'll talk to my parents once they wake up, I said. She coaxed me onto the couch and we played decapitation together until she abruptly dropped the controller. I'm not flirting, I'm just tired, she said, kicking off her flip-flops. She pulled her feet onto the foam couch, tucking them behind the cushion, and scooted up to put her head in my lap. My corduroys, my boxers, two layers. I can feel the warmth of her cheek on my thigh. There are times when it's appropriate, even preferable, to get an erection when someone's face is in close proximity to your penis. This was not one of those times. So I stopped thinking about the layers and the warmth, muted the TV, and focused on decapitation. At 8.30, I turned off the game and scooted out from underneath Alaska. She turned onto her back, still asleep, the lines of my corduroy pants imprinted on her cheek. I usually only called my parents on Sunday afternoons, so when my mom heard my voice, she instantly overreacted. What's wrong, Miles? Are you okay? I'm fine, Mom, I think. If it's okay with you, I think I might stay here for Thanksgiving. A lot of my friends are staying. Why? And I have a lot of work to do. Double why. I had no idea how hard the classes would be, Mom. Truth. Oh, sweetie. We miss you so much. And there's a big Thanksgiving turkey waiting for you. And all the cranberry sauce you can eat. I hated cranberry sauce, but for some reason my mom persisted in her lifelong belief that it was my very favorite food, even though every single Thanksgiving I politely declined to include it on my plate. I know, Mom. I miss you guys too. But I really want to do well here. Truth. And plus, it's really nice to have, like, friends. Truth. I knew that playing the friend card would sell her on the idea, and it did. So I got her blessing to stay on campus after promising to hang out with them for every minute of Christmas break, as if I had other plans. I spent the morning at the computer, flipping back and forth between my religion and English papers. There were only two weeks of classes before exams, the coming one and the one after Thanksgiving, and so far, the best personal answer I had to what happens to people after they die was, well, something, maybe. The colonel came in at noon 
his thick uber math book cradled in his arms. I just saw Sarah, he said. How'd that work out for you? Bad. She said she still loved me. God. I love you really is the gateway drug of breaking up. Saying I love you while walking across a dorm circle inevitably leads to saying I love you while you're doing it. So I just bolted. I laughed. He pulled out a notebook and sat down at his desk. Yeah, ha ha. So, Alaska said you're staying here? Yeah, I feel a little guilty about ditching my parents, though. Yeah, well, if you're staying here in hopes of making out with Alaska, I sure wish you wouldn't. If you unmoor her from the rock that is Jake, God have mercy on us all. That would be some drama indeed, and as a rule, I like to avoid drama. It's not because I want to make out with her. Hold on. He grabbed the pencil and scrawled excitedly at the paper, as if he just made a mathematical breakthrough, and looked back up at me. I just did some calculations, and I've been able to determine that you're full of shit. And he was right. How could I abandon my parents who were nice enough to pay for my education at Culver Creek? My parents who had always loved me, just because I maybe liked some girl with a boyfriend? How could I leave them alone with a giant turkey and mounds of inedible cranberry sauce? So during third period, I called my mom at work. I wanted her to say it was okay, I guess, for me to stay at the creek for Thanksgiving, but I didn't quite expect her to excitedly tell me that she and dad had bought plane tickets to England immediately after I had called and were planning to spend Thanksgiving in a castle on their second honeymoon. Oh, that, that, that's awesome, I said, and then quickly got off the phone because I did not want her to hear me cry. I guess Alaska heard me slam down the phone from her room because she opened the door as I turned away, but said nothing. I walked across the dorm circle and then straight through the soccer field, bushwhacking through the woods until I ended up on the banks of Culver Creek just down from the bridge. I sat with my butt on a rock and my feet in the dark dirt of the creek bed and tossed pebbles into the clear, shallow water, and they landed with an empty plop, barely audible over the rumbling of the creek as it danced its way south. The light filtered through the leaves and pine needles above as if through lace, the ground spotted in shadow. I thought of the one thing about home that I missed. My dad's study with its built-in, floor-to-ceiling shelves sagging with thick biographies and the black leather chair that kept me just uncomfortable enough to keep from feeling sleepy as I read. It was stupid to feel as upset as I did. I ditched them. But it felt the other way around. Still, I felt unmistakably homesick. I looked up toward the bridge and saw Alaska sitting on one of the blue chairs at the smoking hole, and though I'd thought I wanted to be alone, I found myself saying, Hey! Then when she did not turn to me, I screamed, Alaska! She walked over. I was looking for you. She said, joining me on the rock. Hey. I'm really sorry, Pudge. She said and put her arms around me, resting her head against my shoulder. It occurred to me that she didn't even know what had happened, but she still sounded sincere. What am I going to do? You'll spend Thanksgiving with me, silly. Here. So why don't you go home for vacations? I asked her. I'm just scared of ghosts, Pudge. And home is full of them. 52 Days Before After everyone left, after the colonel's mom showed up in a beat-up hatchback and he threw his giant duffel bag into the back seat, and after he said, I'm not much for saying goodbye. I'll see you in a week. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. And after a green limousine arrived for Laura, whose father was the only doctor in some small town in southern Alabama, and after I joined Alaska on a harrowing, we don't need no stinking brakes drive to the airport to drop off to Kumi, and after the campus settled into an eerie quiet, with no door slamming and no music playing, and no one laughing, and no one screaming. After all that, we made our way down to the soccer field, and she took me to the edge of the field where the woods start, the same steps I'd walked on my way to being thrown into the lake. Beneath the full moon, she cast a shadow, and you can see the curve from her waist to her hips in the shadow. And after a while, she stopped and said, Dig. And I said, Dig? And she said, Dig. And we went on like that for a bit, and I got on my knees and dug through the soft black dirt at the edge of the woods, and before I can get very far, my fingers scratched glass, and I dug around the glass until I pulled out a bottle of pink wine. Strawberry Hill, it was called. I suppose because if it had not tasted like vinegar with a dash of maple syrup, it might have tasted like strawberries. I have a fake ID, she said, but it sucks, so every time I go to the liquor store, I try to buy ten bottles of this and some vodka for the colonel. And so when it finally works, I'm covered for a semester. 
And then I give the colonel his vodka, and he puts it wherever he puts it, and I take mine and bury it. Because you're a pirate, I said. Aye, matey, precisely. Although wine consumption has risen a bit this semester, so we'll need to take a trip tomorrow. This is the last bottle. She unscrewed the cap. No corks here. Sipped and handed it to me. Don't worry about the eagle tonight, she said. He's just happy most everyone's gone. He's probably masturbating for the first time in a month. I worried about it for a moment as I held the bottle by the neck, but I wanted to trust her, and so I did. I took a minor sip, and as soon as I swallowed, I felt my body rejecting the stinging syrup of it. It washed back up my esophagus, but I swallowed hard. And there, yes, I did it! I was drinking on campus! So we lay in the tall grass between the soccer field and the woods, passing the bottle back and forth and tilting our heads up to sip the wince-inducing wine. As promised in the list, she brought a Kurt Vonnegut book, Cat's Cradle, and she read aloud to me, her soft voice mingling with the frogs croaking and the grasshoppers landing softly around us. I did not hear her words so much as the cadence of her voice. She'd obviously read the book many times before, and so she read flawlessly and confidently, and I can hear her smile in the reading of it. And the sound of that smile made me think that maybe I would like novels better if Alaska Young read them to me. After a while, she put down the book, and I felt warm, but not drunk, with the bottle resting between us, my chest touching the bottle, and her chest touching the bottle, but us not touching each other. And then she placed her hand on my leg, her hand just above my knee, the palm flat and soft against my jeans, and her index finger making slow, lazy circles that crept toward the inside of my thigh. And with one layer between us, God, I wanted her. And lying there, amid the tall, still grass, and beneath the star-drunk sky, listening to the just this side of inaudible sound of her rhythmic breathing and the noisy silence of the bullfrogs, the grasshoppers, the distant cars rushing endlessly on I-65. I thought it might be a fine time to say the three little words, and I steeled myself to say them as I stared up the starriest night, convinced myself that she felt it too, that her hand so alive and vivid against my leg was more than playful, and fuck Laura, and fuck Jake, because I do, Alaska Young. I do love you. And what else matters but that? My lips parted to speak. Before I can even begin to breathe out the word, she said, It's not life or death, the labyrinth. Uh, um, okay, so what is it? Suffering, she said. Doing wrong and having wrong things happen to you. That's the problem. Bonivar was talking about the pain, not about the living or dying. How do you get out of the labyrinth of suffering? What's wrong? I asked and I felt the absence of her hand on me. Nothing's wrong. But there's always suffering, Pudge. Homework, or malaria, or having a boyfriend who lives far away when there's a good-looking boy lying next to you. Suffering is universal. It's the one thing Buddhists, Christians, and Muslims are all worried about. I turned to her. Oh, so maybe Dr. Hyde's class isn't total bullshit. And both of us lying on our sides. She smiled, our noses almost touching my unblinking eyes on hers, her face blushing from the wine, and I opened my mouth again, but this time not to speak. And she reached up and put a finger to my lips and said, Shh, don't ruin it. Fifty-one days before. The next morning, I didn't hear the knocking, if there was any. I just heard, Up! Do you know what time it is? I looked at the clock and groggily muttered, It's 7.36. No, Pudge, it's party time. We've only got seven days left before everyone comes back. Oh god, I can't even tell you how nice it is to have you here. Last Thanksgiving, I spent the whole time constructing one massive candle using the wax from all my little candles. God, it was boring. I counted the ceiling tiles. 67 down, 84 across. Talk about suffering. Absolute torture. I'm, I'm really tired. I... I said, and then she cut me off. Poor Pudge. Oh, poor, poor Pudge. Do you want me to climb into bed with you and cuddle? Well, if you're offering. No, up, now. She took me behind a wing of weekday warrior rooms, 50 to 59, and she stopped in front of a window, placed her palms flat against it, and pushed up until the window was half open, then crawled inside. I followed. What do you see, Pudge? I saw a dorm room. The same cinder block walls, the same dimensions, even the same layout as my own. Their couch was nicer, and they had an actual coffee table instead of coffee table. They had two posters on the wall. One featured a huge stack of hundred dollar bills with the caption, the first million is the hardest. On the opposite wall, a poster of a red Ferrari. Uh, I see a dorm room. You're not looking, Pudge. 
When I go into your room, I see a couple of guys who love video games. When I look at my room, I see a girl who loves books. She walked over to the couch and picked up a plastic soda bottle. Look at this, she said, and I saw that it was half filled with a blackish brown liquid. Dip spit. So they dip, and they obviously aren't hygienic about it. So are they going to care if we pee on their toothbrushes? They won't care enough, that's for sure. Look, tell me what these guys love. They love money, I said, pointing to the poster. She threw up her hands, exasperated. They all love money, Pudge. Okay, go into the bathroom. Tell me what you see there. The game was annoying me a little, but I went into the bathroom and she sat down on that inviting couch. Inside the shower, I found a dozen bottles of shampoo and conditioner. In the medicine cabinet, I found a cylindrical bottle of something called Rewind. I opened it. The bluish gel smelled like flowers and rubbing alcohol, like a fancy hair salon. Under the sink, I also found a tub of Vaseline so big that it could have only had one possible use, which I didn't care to dwell on. I came back into the room and excitedly said, They love their hair! Precisely! She shouted. Look at the top bunk. Furiously positioned on the thin wooded headboard of the bed, a bottle of Stawet gel. Kevin doesn't just wake up with that spiky bedhead look, Pudge. He works for it. He loves that hair. They leave their hair products here, Pudge, because they have duplicates at home. All those boys do. And you know why? Because they're compensating for their tiny little penises? I asked. Ha ha. No. That's why they're macho assholes. They love their hair because they aren't smart enough to love something more interesting. So we hit them where it hurts. The scalp. Okay. I said unsure of how exactly to prank someone's scalp. She stood up and walked to the window and bent over to shimmy out. Don't look at my ass, she said. And so I looked at her ass, spreading out wide from her thin waist. She effortlessly somersaulted out the half-open window. I took the feet-first approach, and once I got my feet on the ground, I limboed my upper body out the window. Well, she said, that looked awkward. Let's go to the smoking hole. She shuffled her feet to kick up dry orange dirt on the road to the bridge, seeming not to walk so much as cross-country ski. As we followed the almost trail down from the bridge to the hole, she turned around and looked back at me, stopping. I wonder how one would go about acquiring industrial-strength blue dye, she said, and then held a tree branch back for me. 49 Days Before Two days later, Monday, the first real day of vacation, I spent the morning working on my religion final and went to Alaska's room in the afternoon. She was reading in bed. Auden. She announced. What were his last words? Mm, don't know. Never heard of him. Never heard of him? You poor illiterate boy. Here, read this line. I walked over and looked down at her index finger. You shall love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. I read aloud. Yeah, that's pretty good, I said. Pretty good? Sure, and brufritos are pretty good. Sex is pretty fun. The sun is pretty hot. Jesus, it says so much about love and brokenness. It's perfect. Mm-hmm. I nodded unenthusiastically. You're hopeless. Wanna go porn hunting? Huh? We can't love our neighbors till we know how crooked their hearts are. Don't you like porn? She asked, smiling. Um, I answered. The truth was, I hadn't seen much porn, but the idea of looking at porn with Alaska had a certain appeal. We started with the 50s wing of dorms and made our way backward around the hexagon. She pushed open the back windows while I looked out and made sure no one was walking by. I'd never been in most people's rooms. After three months, I knew most people, but I regularly talked to very few. Just the colonel in Alaska and Takumi, really. But in a few hours, I got to know my classmates quite well. Wilson Carbode, the center for the Culver Creek Nothings, had hemorrhoids, or at least he kept hemorrhoidal cream secreted away in the bottom drawer of his desk. Chandra Kylers, a cute girl who loved math a little too much, and who Alaska believed was the colonel's future girlfriend, collected Cabbage Patch Kids. I don't mean that she collected Cabbage Patch Kids when she was, like, five. She collected them now. Dozens of them. Black, white, Latino, and Asian, boys and girls, babies dressed like farmhands and budding businessmen. A senior weekday warrior named Holly Moser sketched nude self-portraits in charcoal pencil, portraying her rotund form in all its girth. I was stunned by how many people had booze. Even the weekday warriors, who got to go home every weekend, had beer and liquor stashed everywhere from toilet tanks to the bottoms of dirty clothes hampers. God, I could have ratted out anyone. Alaska said softly as she unearthed a 40-ounce bottle of Magnum malt liquor from Longwell Chase's closet. 
I wondered then why she had chosen Paul and Maria. Alaska found everyone's secrets so fast I suspected she'd done this before, but she couldn't possibly have had advanced knowledge of the secrets of Ruth and Margaret Bloker, ninth grade twin sisters who were new and seemed to socialize even less than I did. After crawling into their room, Alaska looked around for a moment, then walked to the bookshelf. She stared at it, then pulled out the King James Bible, and there, a purple bottle of Maui Waui wine cooler. How clever, she said as she twisted off the cap. She drank it down in two long sips and then proclaimed, Maui Waui. They'll know you were here, I shouted. Her eyes widened. Oh no, you're right, Pudge, she said. Maybe they'll go to the Eagle and tell him that someone stole their wine cooler. She laughed and leaned out the window, throwing the empty bottle into the grass. And we found plenty of porn magazines haphazardly stuffed in between mattresses and box springs. Turns out that Hank Walston did like something other than basketball and pot. He liked jugs. But we didn't find a movie until room 32, occupied by a couple of guys from Mississippi named Joe and Marcus. They were in our religion class and sometimes sat with the colonel and me at lunch, but I didn't know them well. Alaska read the sticker on the top of the video. The bitches of Madison County. Well, ain't that just delightful. We ran with it to the TV room, closed the blinds, locked the door, and watched the movie. It opened with a woman standing on a bridge where her legs spread while a guy knelt in front of her, giving her oral sex. No time for dialogue, I suppose. By the time they started doing it, Alaska commenced with her righteous indignation. They just don't make sex look fun for women. The girl is just an object. Look! Look at that. I was already looking, needless to say. A woman crouched on her hands and knees while a guy knelt behind her. They kept saying, give it to me, and moaning, and through her eyes, brown and blank betrayed her lack of interest. I couldn't help but take mental notes. Hands on her shoulders, I noted. Fast, but not too fast, or it's going to be over fast. Keep your grunting to a minimum. As if reading my mind, she said, God, Pudge, never do it that hard. That would hurt. That looks like torture. And all she can do is just sit there and take it? This is not a man and a woman. It's a penis and a vagina. What's erotic about that? Where's the kissing? Given their position, I don't think they can kiss right now, I noted. That's my point. Just by virtue of how they're doing it, it's objectification. You can't even see her face. This is what can happen to women, Pudge. That woman is someone's daughter. This is what you make us do for money. Well, not me. I said defensively. I mean, not technically. I don't, like, produce porn movies. Look me in the eye and tell me this doesn't turn you on, Pudge. I couldn't. She laughed. It was fine, she said. Healthy. And then she got up, stopped the tape, lay down on her stomach across the couch, and mumbled something. What did you say? I asked, walking to her, putting my hand on the small of her back. Shh, she said. I'm sleeping. Just like that, from a hundred miles an hour to asleep in a nanosecond. I wanted so badly to lie down next to her on the couch, to wrap my arms around her and sleep. Not a fuck, like in those movies. Not even have sex. Just sleep together, in the most innocent sense of the phrase. But I lacked the courage, and she had a boyfriend, and I was gawky, and she was gorgeous, and I was hopelessly boring, and she was endlessly fascinating. So I walked back to my room and collapsed on the bottom bunk, thinking that if people were rain, I was drizzle, and she was a hurricane. 47 Days Before On Wednesday morning, I woke up with a stuffy nose to an entirely new Alabama, a crisp and cold one. As I walked to Alaska's room that morning, the frosty grass of the dorm circle crunched beneath my shoes. You don't run into frost much in Florida, and I jumped up and down like I was stomping on bubble wrap. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Alaska was holding a burning green candle in her hand upside down dripping the wax onto a larger homemade volcano that looked a bit like a Technicolor middle school science project volcano. Don't burn yourself, I said as the flame crept up toward her hand. Night falls fast, today is in the past, she said without looking up. Uh, wait, I've read that before. What is that? I asked. With her free hand, she grabbed the book and tossed it toward me. It landed at my feet. Poem, she said. Edna St. Vincent Millay. You've read that? I'm stunned. Oh, I read her biography. Didn't have her last words in it, though. I was a little bitter. All I remember is that she had a lot of sex. I know. She's my hero. Alaska said without a trace of irony. I laughed, but she didn't notice. Does it seem at all odd to you that you enjoy biographies of great writers a lot more than you enjoy their actual writing? Nope, I announced. 
Just because they were interesting people doesn't mean I care to hear their musings on nighttime. It's about depression, dumbass. Oh, really? Jeez, oh, then it's brilliant, I answered. She sighed. All right, the snow may be falling on the winter of my discontent, but at least I've got sarcastic company. Sit down, will ya? I sat down next to her with my legs crossed and our knees touching. She pulled a clear plastic crate filled with dozens of candles out from underneath her bed. She looked at it for a moment, then handed me a white one and a lighter. We spent all morning burning candles, well, and occasionally lighting cigarettes off the burning candles after we stuffed a towel into the crack at the bottom of her door. Over the course of two hours, we added a full foot to the summit of her polychrome candle volcano. Mount St. Helens on acid, she said. At 2.30, after two hours of me begging for a ride to McDonald's, Alaska decided it was time for lunch. As we began to walk to the student parking lot, I saw a strange car. A small green car. A hatchback. I've seen that car, I thought. Where have I seen that car? And then the colonel jumped out and ran to meet us. Rather than like, I don't know, hello or something, the colonel began. I have been instructed to invite you to Thanksgiving dinner at Chez Martin. Alaska whispered into my ear and then I laughed and said, I have been instructed to accept your invitation. So we walked over to the Eagle's house, told him we were going to eat turkey trailer park style, and sped away in the hatchback. The colonel explained it to us on the two-hour car ride south. I was crammed into the back seat because Alaska had called shotgun. She usually drove, but when she didn't, she was shotgun calling queen of the world. The colonel's mother heard that we were on campus and couldn't bear the thought of leaving us family lists for Thanksgiving. The colonel didn't seem too keen on the whole idea. I'm going to have to sleep in a tent, he said, and I laughed. Except it turns out he did have to sleep in a tent. A nice four-person green outfit shaped like half an egg, but still a tent. The colonel's mom lived in a trailer, as in the kind of thing you might see attached to a large pickup truck, except this particular one was old and falling apart on its cinder blocks, and probably couldn't have been hooked up to a truck without disintegrating it. It wasn't even a particularly big trailer. I could just barely stand up to my full height without scraping the ceiling. Now I understood why the colonel was short. He couldn't afford to be any taller. The place was really one long room with a full-size bed in the front, a kitchenette and a living area in the back with a TV and a small bathroom. So small that in order to take a shower, you pretty much had to sit on the toilet. Eh, it ain't much. The colonel's mom. Oh, that's Dolores, not Miss Martin. Told us. But y'all's gonna have a turkey the size of the kitchen. She laughed. The colonel ushered us out of the trailer immediately after our brief tour, and we walked through the neighborhood, a series of trailers and mobile homes on dirt roads. Well, now you get why I hate rich people. And I did. I couldn't fathom how the colonel grew up in such a small place. The entire trailer was smaller than our dorm room. I didn't know what to say to him. I had to make him feel less embarrassed. I'm sorry if that makes you uncomfortable, he said. I know it's probably foreign. Not to me. Alaska piped up. Well, you don't live in a trailer, he told her. Poor is poor. I suppose, the colonel said. Alaska decided to go help Dolores with dinner. She said that it was sexist to leave the cooking to the woman, but better to have good sexist food than crappy boy-prepared food. So the colonel and I sat on the pull-out couch in the living room, playing video games and talking about school. I finished my religion paper, but I have to type it up on your computer when we get back. I think I'm ready for finals, which is good, since we have an ank prey to an play. Your mom doesn't know pig Latin? I smirked. Not if I talk fast. Christ, be quiet. The food. Fried okra, steamed corn on the cob, and pot roast that was so tender it fell right off the plastic fork. Convinced me that Dolores was an even better cook than Marine. Culver Creek's okra had less grease, more crunch. Dolores was also the funniest mom I'd ever met. When Alaska asked her what she did for work, she smiled and said, I'm a culinary engineer. That's a short order cook at the Waffle House to y'all. Best Waffle House in Alabama. The colonel smiled, and then I realized he wasn't embarrassed of his mom at all. He was just scared that he would act like condescending boarding school snobs. I'd always found the colonel's I hate the rich routine a little overwrought until I saw him with his mom. He was the same colonel, but in a totally different context. It made me hope that one day I could meet Alaska's family too. Dolores insisted that Alaska and I share the bed, and she slept in the pullout while the colonel was out in his tent. I worried he would get cold, but frankly, I wasn't about to give up my bed with Alaska. We had separate blankets, and there were never fewer than three layers between us, but the possibilities kept me up half the night. 46 Days Before Best Thanksgiving Food 
I'd ever had. No crappy cranberry sauce, just huge slabs of moist white meat, corn, green beans cooked in enough bacon fat to make them taste like they weren't good for you, biscuits of gravy, pumpkin pie for dessert, and a glass of red wine for each of us. I believe, Dolores said, that you're supposed to drink white with turkey, but now I don't know about y'all, but I don't suppose I give a shit. We laughed and drank our wine, and then after the meal, we each listed our gratitudes. My family always did that before the meal, and we all just rushed through it to get to the food. So the four of us sat around the table and shared our blessings. I was thankful for the fine food and the fine company, for having a home on Thanksgiving. A trailer, at least, Dolores joked. Okay, my turn, Alaska said. I'm grateful for having just had my best Thanksgiving in a decade. Then the colonel said, I'm just grateful for you, Mom. And Dolores laughed and said, That dog won't hunt, boy. I didn't exactly know what that phrase meant, but apparently it meant that was inadequate. Because then the colonel expanded his list to acknowledge that he was grateful to be the smartest human being in this trailer park. And Dolores laughed and said, Good enough. And Dolores? She was grateful that her phone was back on, that her boy was home, that Alaska helped her cook, and that I had kept the colonel out of her hair, that her job was steady and her co-workers were nice, that she had a place to sleep and a boy who loved her. I sat in the back of the hatchback on the drive home, and that is how I thought of it. Home. And I fell asleep to the highway's monotonous lullaby. 44 Days Before Kusa Liquor's entire business model is built around selling cigarettes to minors and alcohol to adults. Alaska looked at me with disconcerting frequency when she drove, particularly since we were winding through a narrow, hilly highway south of school, headed to the aforementioned Kusa Liquor's. It was Saturday, our last day of real vacation. Which is great if all you need is cigarettes, but we need booze, and they card for booze, and my ID blows, but I'll flirt my way through. She made a sudden and unsignaled left turn, pulling onto a road that dropped precipitously down a hill with fields on either side, and she gripped the steering wheel tight as we accelerated, and she waited until the last possible moment to brake, just before we reached the bottom of the hill. There stood a plywood gas station that no longer sold gas with a faded sign bolted to the roof. Kusa Liquors, we cater to your spiritual needs. Alaska went in alone and walked out the door five minutes later, weighed down by two paper bags filled with contraband, three cartons of cigarettes, five bottles of wine, and a fifth of vodka for the colonel. On the way home, Alaska said, You like knock-knock jokes? Uh, knock-knock jokes? I asked. You mean like, knock-knock. Who's there? replied Aska. Who? Who who? What are you? An owl? I finished. Lame. That was brilliant, said Alaska. I have one. You start. Okay. Knock knock. Who's there? said Alaska. I looked at her blankly. About a minute later, I got it and laughed. My mom told me that joke when I was six. It's still funny. So I could not have been more surprised when she showed up sobbing at room 43 just as I was putting the finishing touches on my final paper for English. She sat down on the couch, her heavy exhalation a mix of whimper and scream. I'm sorry, she said, heaving. Snot was dribbling down her chin. What's wrong? I asked. She picked up a Kleenex from the coffee table and wiped at her face. I don't... She started, and then a sob came like a tsunami. Her cry so loud and childlike that it scared me. And I got up, sat down next to her, and put my arm around her. She turned away, pushing her head into the foam of the couch. I don't understand why I screw everything up. She said. What, like with Maria? Maybe you were just scared. Scared isn't a good excuse. She shouted into the couch. Scared is the excuse everyone has always used. I didn't know who everyone was, or when always was, and as much as I wanted to understand her ambiguities, the slyness was growing annoying. Why are you upset about this now? It's not just that. It's everything. But I told the colonel in the car. She sniffled but seemed done with the sobs. While you were sleeping in the back, And he said he'd never let me out of his sight during pranks. That he couldn't even trust me on my own. And I don't blame him. I don't even trust me. It took guts to tell him, I said. I have guts. Just not when it counts. Will you, um... And she sat up straight and then moved toward me. And I raised my arm as she collapsed into my skinny chest and cried. I felt bad for her, but she'd done it to herself. She didn't have to rat. I don't want to upset you, but maybe you just need to tell us all why you told on Maria. Were you scared of going home or something? She pulled away from me and gave me a look of doom that would have made the eagle proud. 
and I felt like she hated me or hated my question, or both. And then she looked away out the window toward the soccer field and said, There's no home. Well, you have a family, I backpedaled. She talked to me about her mom just that morning. How could the girl who told that joke three hours before become a sobbing mess? Still staring at me, she said, I try not to be scared, you know, but I still ruin everything. I still fuck up. Okay, I told her. It's okay. I didn't even know what she was talking about anymore. One vague notion after another. Don't you know who you love, Pudge? You love the girl who makes you laugh and shows you porn and drinks wine with you. You don't love the crazy, sullen bitch. And there was something to that, truth be told. Christmas We all went home for Christmas break, even purportedly homeless Alaska. I got a nice watch and a new wallet. Grown-up gifts, my dad called them. But mostly I just studied for those two weeks. Christmas vacation wasn't really a vacation, on account of how it was our last chance to study for exams, which started the day after we got back. I focused on pre-calc and biology, the two classes that most deeply threatened my goal of a 3.4 GPA. I wish I could say I was in it for the thrill of learning, but mostly I was in it for the thrill of getting into a worthwhile college. So yeah, I spent a lot of my time at home studying math and memorizing French vocab, just like I had before Culver Creek. Really, being at home for two weeks was just like my entire life before Culver Creek, except my parents were more emotional. They talked very little about their trip to London. I think they felt guilty. That's a funny thing about parents. Even though I pretty much stayed at the creek over Thanksgiving because I wanted to, my parents still felt guilty. It's nice to have people who will feel guilty for you, although I could have lived without my mom crying during every single family dinner. She would say, I'm a bad mother, and my dad and I would immediately reply, no you're not. Even my dad, who was affectionate but not like sentimental, randomly while we were watching The Simpsons, said he missed me. I said I missed him too, and I did. Sort of. They're such nice people. We went to movies and played card games, and I told them the stories I could tell without horrifying them, and they listened. My dad, who sold real estate for a living but read more books than anyone I knew, talked with me about the books I was reading for English class, and my mom insisted that I sit with her in the kitchen and learn how to make simple dishes, macaroni, scrambled eggs. Now that I was living on my own, Never mind that I didn't have or want a kitchen. Never mind that I didn't like eggs or macaroni and cheese. By New Year's Day, I can make them anyway. When I left, they both cried, my mom explaining that it was just empty nest syndrome, that they were just so proud of me, that they loved me so much. That put a lump in my throat, and I didn't care about Thanksgiving anymore. I had a family. Eight Days Before Alaska walked in on the first day back from Christmas break and sat beside the colonel on the couch. The colonel was hard at work, breaking a land speed record on the PlayStation. She didn't say she missed him or that she was glad to see us. She just looked at the couch and said, You really need a new couch. Please don't address me when I'm racing, the colonel said. God, does Jeff Gordon have to put up with this shit? I've got an idea, she said. It's great. What we need is a pre-prank that coincides with an attack on Kevin and his minions, she said. I was sitting on the bed, reading the textbook in preparation for my American history exam the next day. A pre-prank? I asked. A prank designed to lull the administration into a false sense of security, the colonel answered, annoyed by the distraction. After the pre-prank, the eagle will think the junior class has done its prank and won't be waiting for it when it actually comes. Every year, the junior and senior classes pulled off a prank at some point in the year, Usually something lame, like Roman candles in the dorm circle at five in the morning on a Sunday. Is there always a pre-prank? I asked. No, you idiot, the colonel said. If there was always a pre-prank, then the eagle would expect two pranks. The last time a pre-prank was used... Hmm. Oh, right, 1987. When the pre-prank was cutting off electricity to campus, and then the actual prank was putting 500 live crickets in the heating ducts of the classrooms. Sometimes you can still hear the chirping. Your rote memorization is, like, so impressive, I said. You guys are like an old married couple. Alaska smiled. In a creepy way. You don't know the half of it, the colonel said. You should see this kid try and crawl into bed with me at night. Hey! Let's get on subject, Alaska said. Pre-prank. This weekend... Since there's a new moon, we're staying at the barn. You, me, 
the colonel, Takumi, and, as a special gift to you, Pudge, Lara Buderskaya. The Laura Buderskaya I puked on? <laughs> She's just shy. She still likes you. Alaska laughed. Puking made you look vulnerable. Very perky boobs, the colonel said. Are you bringing Takumi for me? You need to be single for a while. True enough, the colonel said. Just spend a few more months playing video games, she said. That hand-eye coordination will come in handy when you get to third base. Gosh, I haven't heard the base system in so long. I think I've forgotten third base, the colonel responded. I would roll my eyes at you, but I can't afford to look away from the screen. French, feel, finger, fuck. It's like you skipped the third grade, Alaska said. I did skip third grade, the colonel answered. So, I said, what's our pre-prank? The colonel and I will work that out. No need to get you into trouble. Yet. Oh. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go for a cigarette then. I left. It wasn't the first time Alaska had left me out of the loop, certainly. But after we'd been together so much over Thanksgiving, it seemed ridiculous to plan the prank with the colonel, but without me. Whose t-shirts were wet with her tears? Mine. Who'd listened to her read Vonnegut? Me. Who'd been the butt of the world's worst knock-knock joke? Me. I walked to the sunny convenience kiosk across from school and smoked. This never happened to me in Florida. This oh-so high school angst about who likes whom more. I hated myself for letting it happen now. Don't have to care about her, I told myself. Screw her. Four days before. The colonel wouldn't tell me a word about the pre-prank, except that it was to be called barn night, and that when I packed, I should pack for two days. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday were torture. The colonel was always with Alaska, and I was never invited, so I spent an inordinate amount of time studying for finals, which helped my GPA considerably. And I finally finished my religion paper. My answer to the question was straightforward enough, really. Most Christians and Muslims believed in a heaven and hell, though there's a lot of disagreement within both religions over what, exactly, will get you into one afterlife or the other. Buddhists are more complicated. Because of the Buddha's doctrine of anatta, which basically says that people don't have eternal souls, instead, they have a bundle of energy, and that bundle of energy is transitory, migrating from one body to another, reincarnating endlessly until it eventually reaches enlightenment. I never liked writing concluding paragraphs to papers, where you just repeat what you've already said with phrases like in summation and to conclude. I didn't do that. Instead, I talked about why I thought it was an important question. People, I thought, wanted security. They couldn't bear the idea of death being a big black nothing, couldn't bear the thought of their loved ones not existing, and couldn't even imagine themselves not existing. I finally decided that people believed in an afterlife because they couldn't bear not to. Three days before. On Friday, after a surprisingly successful pre-calc exam that brought my first set of Culver Creek finals to a close, I packed clothes. Think New York trendy, the colonel advised. Think black. Think sensible. Comfortable, but warm. And my sleeping bag into a backpack, and we picked up Takumi in his room and walked to the eagle's house. The eagle was wearing his only outfit, and I wondered whether he just had 30 identical white button-down shirts and 30 identical black ties in the closet. I pictured him waking up in the morning, staring at his closet, and thinking, Hmm. Hmm. How about a white shirt and a black tie? Talk about a guy who can use a wife. I'm taking Miles and Takumi home for the weekend to New Hope, the colonel told him. Miles liked his taste of New Hope that much? The eagle asked me. Yeehaw! There's gonna be a hoe down at the trailer park, the colonel said. He can actually have a southern accent when he wanted to. Although, like most everyone at Culver Creek, he didn't usually speak with one. Hold on one moment while I call your mom, the eagle said to the colonel. Takumi looked at me with poorly disguised panic, and I felt lunch fried chicken rising in my stomach, but the colonel just smiled. Sure thing. Chip and Miles and Takumi will be at your house this weekend? Yes, ma'am. Ha! Okay. Bye now. The eagle looked up at the colonel. Your mom is a wonderful woman. The eagle smiled. You're telling me. The colonel grinned. See you on Sunday. As we walked toward the gym parking lot, the colonel said, I called her yesterday and asked her to cover for me, and she didn't even ask why. She just said, I sure trust you, son, and hot damn she does. 
Once out of sight of the eagle's house, we took a sharp right into the woods. We walked on the dirt road over the bridge and back to the school's barn, a dilapidated leak-prone structure that looked more like a long-abandoned log cabin than a barn. They still stored hay there, although I don't know what for. It wasn't like we had an equestrian program or anything. The colonel, Takubi, and I got there first, setting up our sleeping bags on the softest bales of hay. It was 6.30. Alaska came shortly after, having told the eagle she was spending the weekend with Jake. The eagle didn't check that story because Alaska spent at least one week in there every month, and he knew that her parents never cared. Laura showed up half an hour later. She told the eagle that she was driving to Atlanta to see an old friend from Romania. The eagle called Laura's parents to make sure that they knew she was spending a weekend off campus, and they didn't mind. They trust me. She smiled. You don't sound like you have an accent sometimes, I said, which was pretty stupid, but a darn sight better than throwing up on her. It's only soft eyes. No soft eyes in Russian? I asked. Romanian. She corrected me. Turns out Romanian is a language. Who knew? My cultural sensitivity quotient was going to have to drastically increase if I was going to share a sleeping bag with Laura anytime soon. Everybody was sitting on sleeping bags, Alaska smoking with flagrant disregard for the overwhelming flammability of the structure, when the colonel pulled out a single piece of computer paper and read from it. The point of this evening's festivities is to prove once and for all that we are to pranking what the weekday warriors are to sucking. But we'll also have the opportunity to make life unpleasant for the eagle, which is always a welcome pleasure. And so, he said, pausing as if for a drum roll, we fight tonight a battle on three fronts. Front one, the pre-prank. We will, as it were, light a fire under the eagle's ass. Front two, Operation Baldy, wherein Lara flies solo in a retaliatory mission so elegant and so cruel that it could only have been the brainchild of, well, me. Hey. Alaska interrupted. It was my idea. <laughs> okay, fine. It was Alaska's idea. He laughed. And finally, front three, the progress reports. We're going to hack into the faculty computer network and use their grading database to send out letters to Kevin et al's family saying that they are failing some of their classes. We are definitely going to get expelled, I said. I hope you didn't bring the Asian kid along because he's a computer genius, because I am not, Takumi said. We're not going to get expelled and I'm the computer genius. The rest of you are muscle and distraction. We won't get expelled even if we get caught because there are no expellable offenses here. Well, except for the five bottles of Strawberry Hill in Alaska's backpack, and that will be well hidden. We're just, you know, wreaking a little havoc. The plan was laid out, and it left no room for error. The colonel relied so heavily on perfect synchronicity that if one of us messed up even slightly, the endeavor would collapse entirely. He had printed up individual itineraries for each of us, including times exact to the second. Our watches synchronized, our clothes black, our backpacks on, our breath visible in the cold, our minds filled with the minute details of the plan, our hearts racing. We walked out of the barn together once it was completely dark, around seven. The five of us walking confidently in a row. I never felt cooler. The great perhaps was upon us, and we were invincible. The plan may have had faults, but we did not. After five minutes, we split up to go to our destinations. I stuck with Takumi. We were the distraction. We're the fucking marines, he said. First to fight, first to die, I agreed nervously. Hell yes. He stopped and opened his bag. Not here, dude, I said. We have to go to the Eagles. I know, I know, just hold on. He pulled out a thick headband. It was brown with a plush fox head on the front. He put it on his head. I laughed. <laughs> what the hell is that? It's my fox hat. Your fox hat? Yeah, Pudge, my fox hat hat. <laughs> Why are you wearing your fox hat? I asked. Because no one can catch the motherfucking fox. <laughs> Two minutes later, we were crouched behind the trees, 50 feet from the eagle's back door. My heart thumped like a techno drum beat. 30 seconds. Takumi whispered, and I felt the same spooked nervousness that I had felt the first night with Alaska when she grabbed my hand and whispered, run, 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 run. But I stayed put. I thought, we are not close enough. I thought, he will not hear it. I thought, he will hear it and be out so fast that we have no chance. I thought, 20 seconds. I was breathing hard and fast. Hey, Pudge. Takumi whispered. You can do this, dude. It's just running. Right. Just running. My knees are good. My lungs are fair. It's just running. Five. 
he said. Four, three, two, one. Light it, light it, light it, light it. It lit with a sizzle that reminded me of every July 4th of my family. We stood still for a nanosecond, staring at the fuse, making sure it was lit. And now I thought, now, run, 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 run. But my body didn't move until I heard Takumi's shout whisper. Go, 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 fucking go. And we went. Three seconds later, a huge burst of pops. It sounded to me like the automatic gunfire and decapitation, except louder. We were 20 steps away already, and I thought my ear jumps would burst. I thought, well, he will certainly hear it. We ran past the soccer field and into the woods, running uphill, and with only the vaguest sense of direction. In the dark, fallen branches and moss-covered rocks appeared at the last possible second, and I slipped and fell repeatedly and worried that the eagle would catch up, but I just kept getting up and running beside Takumi, away from the classrooms and the dorm circle. We ran like we had golden shoes. I ran like a cheetah. Well, like a cheetah that smoked too much. And then, after precisely one minute of running, Takumi stopped and ripped open his backpack. My turn to count down, staring at my watch, terrified. But now he was surely out. He was surely running. I wondered if he was fast. He was old, but he'd be mad. Five, four, three, two, one. And the sizzle. We didn't pause that time. Just ran. Still west. Breath heaving. I wondered if I could do this for 30 minutes. The firecrackers exploded. The pops ended and a voice cried out, Stop right now! But we did not stop. Stopping was not in the plan. I'm the motherfucking fox. Takumi whispered both to himself and to me. No one can catch the fox. A minute later, I was on the ground. Takumi counted down. The fuse lit. We ran. But it was a dud. We had prepared for one dud, bringing an extra string of firecrackers. Another, though, would cost the colonel in Alaska a minute. Takumi crouched down on the ground, lit the fuse, and ran. The popping started. The fireworks, bang, 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 and sink with my heartbeat. When the firecrackers finished, I heard, Stop or I'll call the police! And though the voice was distant, I can feel his look of doom bearing down on me. The pigs can't stop the fox, I'm too quick, Takumi said to himself. I can run while I run, I'm not slick. The colonel warned us about the police threat, told us not to worry. The eagle didn't like to bring the police to campus, bad publicity. So we ran, over and under and through all manner of trees and bushes and branches. We fell, we got up, we ran. If he couldn't follow us with the firecrackers, he can sure as hell follow the sound of our whispered shits so we tripped over dead logs and fell into briar bushes. One minute. I knelt down, lit the fuse, ran, bang. Then we turned north, thinking we'd gotten past the lake. This was the key to the plan. The farther we got while still staying on campus, the farther the eagle would follow us. The farther he followed us, the farther he would be from the classrooms, where the colonel and Alaska were working their magic. And then we planned to loop back near the classrooms and swing east along the creek until we came to the bridge over our smoking hole, where we would rejoin the road and walk back to the barn, triumphant. But here's the thing. We made a slight error in navigation. We weren't past the lake. Instead, we were staring at a field and then the lake. Too close to the classrooms to run anywhere but along the lakefront, I looked over at Takumi, who was running with me stride for stride, and he just said, Drop one now. So I dropped down, lit the fuse, and we ran. We were running through a clearing now, and if the eagle was behind us, he could see us. We got to the south corner of the lake and started running along the shore. The lake wasn't all that big, maybe a quarter mile long, so we didn't have far to go when I saw it. A swan. Swimming toward us like a swan possessed, wings flapping furiously as it came, and then it was on the shore in front of us, making a noise that sounded like nothing else in this world, like all the worst parts of a dying rabbit, plus all the worst parts of a crying baby, and there was no other way, so we just ran. I hit the swan at full run and felt it bite into my ass. And then I was running with a noticeable limp because my ass was on fire. I thought to myself, what the hell is in swan saliva that burns so badly? The 23rd string was a dud, costing us one minute. At that point, I wanted a minute. I was dying. The burning sensation in my left buttocks had dulled to an intense aching, magnified each time I landed on my left leg, so I was running like an injured gazelle trying to evade a pride of lions. Our speed, needless to say, had slowed considerably. We hadn't heard the eagle since we got across the lake, but I didn't think he had turned around. He was trying to lull us into complacency, but it would not work. Tonight, we were invincible. Exhausted, we stopped with three strings left and hoped we'd given the colonel enough time. We ran for a few more minutes until we found the bank of the creek. It was so dark and so still that the tiny stream of water seemed to roar, but I could still hear our hard, fast breaths as we collapsed on wet clay and pebbles beside the creek. Only when we stopped did I look at Takumi. His face and arms were scratched. The fox had now directly over his left ear. 
Looking at my own arms, I noticed blood dripping from the deeper cuts. There were, I remember now, some wicked briar patches, but I was feeling no pain. Takumi picked thorns out of his legs. The fox is fucking tired, <laughs> he said and laughed. A swan bit my ass, I told him. I saw. He smiled. Is it bleeding? I reached my hand to my pan to check. No blood, so I smoked to celebrate. Mission accomplished, I said. Pudge, my friend, we are in the fucking structable. We couldn't figure out where we were because the creek doubles back so many times through the campus, so we followed the creek for about ten minutes, figuring we walked half as fast as we ran and then turned left. Left, you think? Takumi said. I'm pretty lost, I said. The fox is pointing left, so left. And sure enough, the fox took us right back to the barn. You okay? Laura said as we walked up. I was worried. I saw the eagle run out of his house. He was wearing pajamas. He sure looked mad. I said, well, if he was mad, then I wouldn't want to see him now. What took you so long? She asked me. We took the long way home, Takumi said. Plus, Pudge is walking around like an old lady with hemorrhoids because the swan bit him on the ass. Where's Alaska and the colonel? I don't know, Laura said. Then we heard footsteps in the distance, mutters and cracking branches. In a flash, Takumi grabbed our sleeping bags and backpacks and hid them behind bales of hay. The three of us ran to the back of the barn and into the waist-high grass and lay down. He tracked us back to the barn, I thought. We fucked everything up. But then I heard the colonel's voice, distinct and very annoyed, saying, Because it narrows the list of possible suspects by 23. Why couldn't you just follow the plan? Christ, where is everybody? We walked back to the barn, a bit sheepish from having overreacted. The colonel sat down on a bale of hay, his elbows on his knees, his head bowed his palms against his forehead, thinking. Well, we haven't been caught yet, anyway. Okay, first, he said without looking up. Tell me everything else went all right. Laura? She started talking. Yes, good. Can I have some more detail, please? I did like your paper set. I stayed behind the eagle's house until I saw him run after Miles and Takumi, and then I ran behind the dorms, and then I went through the window into Kevin's room, then I put the stuff in the gel and the conditioner, and then I did the same thing in Jeff and Longwell's room. The stuff? I asked. Undiluted industrial strength blue number five hair dye. Alaska said. Which I bought with your cigarette money. Apply it to wet hair, and it won't wash out for months. We dyed their hair blue? Well, technically... The colonel said, still speaking into his lap. They're going to dye their own hair blue. But we have certainly made it easier for them. I know you and Takumi did all right, because we're here and you're here. So you did your job. And the good news is that the three assholes who had the gall to prank us have progress reports coming saying that they are failing three classes. Uh-oh. What's the bad news? Laura asked. Oh, come on. Alaska said. The other good news is that while the colonel was worried he'd heard something and ran into the woods, I saw to it that 20 other weekday warriors also have progress reports coming. I printed out reports for all of them, stuffed them into metered school envelopes, and then put them in the mailbox. She turned to the colonel. You sure were gone a long time, she said. The widow colonel so scared of getting expelled. The colonel stood up, towering over the rest of us as we sat. That is not good news. That was not the plan. That means there are 23 people who the eagle can eliminate as suspects. 23 people who might figure out it was us and Rat. If that happens... Alaska said very seriously. I'll take the fall. Right, the colonel sighed. Like you took the fall for Paul and Maria? You'll say that while you were traipsing through the woods lighting firecrackers, you were simultaneously hacking into the faculty network and printing out false progress reports on school stationery. Because I'm sure that will fly with the eagle. Relax, dude, Takumi said. First off, we're not going to get caught. Second off, if we do, I'll take the fall with Alaska. You've got more to lose than any of us. The colonel just nodded. It was an undeniable fact. The colonel would have no chance at a scholarship to a good school if he got expelled from the creek. Knowing that nothing cheered up the colonel like acknowledging his brilliance, I asked, So, how'd you hack the network? I climbed in the window of Dr. Hyde's office, booted up his computer, and I typed in his password. He said, smiling. You guessed it? No. On Tuesday, I went into his office and asked him to print me a copy of the recommended reading list. And then I watched him type the password. J3 
C-K-Y-L-N-H-Y-D-3. Well, shit. Takumi said, I could have done that. <laughs> sure, but then you wouldn't have gotten to wear that sexy hat. The colonel said laughing. Takumi took the headband off and put it in his bag. Kevin is going to be pissed about his hair, I said. Yeah, well, I'm really pissed about my waterlogged library. Kevin is a blow-up doll, Alaska said. Prick us, we bleed. Prick him, he pops. It's true, said Takumi. The guy is a dick. He kind of tried to kill you after all. Yeah, I guess, I acknowledge. There are a lot of people here like that. Alaska went on, still fuming. You know, fucking blow-up doll rich kids. But even though Kevin had sort of tried to kill me and all, he really didn't seem worth hating. Hating the cool kids takes an awful lot of energy, and I'd given up on it a long time ago. For me, the prank was just a response to a previous prank, just a golden opportunity to, as the colonel said, wreak a little havoc. But to Alaska, it seemed to be something else, something more. I wanted to ask her about it, but she lay back down behind the piles of hay, invisible again. Alaska was done talking, and when she was done talking, that was it. We didn't coax her out for two hours until the colonel unscrewed a bottle of wine. We passed around the bottle till I can feel it in my stomach. Sour and warm. I wanted to like booze more than I actually did, which is more or less the precise opposite of how I felt about Alaska. But that night, the booze felt great. As the warmth of the wine in my stomach spread through my body, I didn't like feeling stupid or out of control, but I liked the way it made everything. Laughing, crying, peeing in front of your friends. Easier. Why did we drink? For me, it was just fun, particularly since we were risking expulsion. The nice thing about the constant threat of expulsion at Culver Creek is that it lends excitement to every moment of illicit pleasure. The bad thing, of course, is that there is always the possibility of actual expulsion. Two days before. I woke up early the next morning, my lips dry and my breath visible in the crisp air. Takumi had brought a camp stove in his backpack and the colonel was huddled over it, heating instant coffee. The sun shone bright but could not combat the cold, and I sat with the colonel and sipped the coffee. The thing about instant coffee is that it smells pretty good, but tastes like stomach bile, the colonel said. And then one by one, Takumi and Laura and Alaska woke up, and we spent the day hiding out, but loudly. Hiding out loud. At the barn that afternoon, Takumi decided we needed to have a freestyle contest. You start, Pudge, Takumi said. Colonel Catastrophe, you're our beatbox. Dude, I can't rap, I pled. That's okay. The colonel can't drop beats either. Just try and rhyme a little and send it over to me. With his hand cupped over his mouth, the colonel started to make absurd noises that sounded more like farting than bass beats. And I, uh, rapped. Um, we're sitting in the barn and the sun's going down. When I was a kid at Burger King, I wore a crown. Dude, I can't rhyme for shit. So let my boy Takumi rip it. Takumi took over without pausing. Damn, Pudge, I'm not sure I'm quite ready. But like Nightmare on Elm Street's Freddy, I always got the goods to rip shit up. Last night I drank wine as it was like hiccup, hiccup. The colonel's beats are sick like malaria. When I rock the mic, the ladies suffer hysteria. I represent Japan as well as Birmingham. When I was a kid, they called me Yellow Man. But I ain't ashamed of my skin color, and neither are the countless bitches that call me lover. Alaska jumped in. Oh shit, did you just diss the feminine gender? I'll pummel your ass, then stick you in a blender. You think I like Tori and Annie so I can't rhyme? But I got flow like Ghostbusters got slime. Objectify women and it's fucking on. You'll be dead and gone like ancient Babylon. Takumi picked it up again. If my eye offends me, I will pluck it out. I got props for girls like old man got gout. Oh shit, now my rhyming's got all whack. Laura, help me out and pick up the slack. Laura rhymed quietly and nervously, and with even more flagrant disregard for the beat than me. My name's Lada, and I'm from Romania. This is pretty hard. Um, I once visited Albania. I love writing in Alaska's geo. My two best vowels in English are EO. I'm not so good with the little eyes, but they make me sound cosmopolitan, right? Oh, Takumi, I think I'm done. Into this game with some fun. I drop bombs like Hiroshima, or better yet, Nagasaki. When girls hear me flow, they think I'm rocky. To represent my homeland, I still drink sake. The kids don't get my rhyming, so sometimes they mock me. My build ain't small, but I wouldn't call it stocky. Then again, unlike Pudge, I'm not super gawky. 
I'm the fucking fox, and this is my crew. Our freestyles infused with funk, like my gym shoes. And we're out. The colonel wrapped it up with freestyle beatboxing, and we gave ourselves a round of applause. You ripped it up, Alaska. <laughs> Takumi says, laughing. I do what I can to represent the ladies. Laura had my back. Yeah, I did. And then Alaska decided that although it wasn't nearly dark yet, it was time for us to get shit-faced. Two nights in a row is maybe pushing our luck. Takumi said as Alaska opened the wine. Luck is for suckers. She smiled and put the bottle to her lips. We had saltines and a hunk of cheddar cheese provided by the colonel for dinner, and sipping the warm pink wine out of the bottle with our cheese and saltines made for a fine dinner. And when we ran out of cheese, well, all the more room for Strawberry Hill. We have to slow down, or I'll puke, I remarked after we finished the first bottle. I'm sorry, Pudge. I wasn't aware that someone was holding open your throat and pouring wine down it. The colonel responded, tossing me a bottle of Mountain Dew. <laughs> it's a little charitable to call this shit wine. Takumi cracked. And then, as if out of nowhere, Alaska announced, Best day, worst day. Huh? I asked. We are all going to puke if we just drink, so we'll slow it down with the drinking game. Best day, worst day. Never heard of it, the colonel said. Because I just made it up. She smiled. She lay on her sides across two bales of hay, the afternoon light brightening the green in her eyes, her tan skin the last memory of fall. With her mouth half open, it occurred to me that she must already be drunk, as I noticed the far-off look in her eyes. The thousand yards stare of intoxication, I thought, and as I watched her with an idle fascination, it occurred to me that, yeah, I was a little drunk too. Fun. What are the rules? Laura asked. Everyone tells the story of their best day. The best storyteller doesn't have to drink. Then everybody tells the story of their worst day, and the best storyteller doesn't have to drink. Then we keep going. Second best day, second worst day, until one of y'all quits. How do you know it'll be one of us? Takumi asked. Because I'm the best drinker and the best storyteller. She answered. Hard to disagree with that logic. You start, Pudge. Best day of your life. Um, can I take a minute to think of one? Couldn't have been that good if you have to think about it, the colonel said. Fuck you, dude. Touchy. Best day of my life was today, I said. And the story is that I woke up next to a very pretty Hungarian girl. And it was cold, but not too cold. And I had a cup of lukewarm instant coffee and ate Cheerios without milk, and then walked through the woods of Alaska and Takumi. We skipped stones across the creek, which sounds dumb, but it wasn't. I don't know, like the way the sun is right now, with the long shadows and that kind of bright... Soft light you get when the sun isn't quite setting. That's the light that makes everything better. Everything prettier. And today, everything just seemed to be in that light. I mean, I didn't do anything. But just sitting here. Even if I'm watching the Colonel Whittle or whatever. Whatever. Great day. Today. Best day of my life. You think I'm pretty? Laura said and laughed, bashful. I thought it'd be good to make eye contact with her now. But I couldn't. And I'm Romanian. That story ended up being a hell of a lot better than I thought it would be, Alaska said. But I've still got your beat. Bring it on, baby, I said. A breeze picked up, the tall grass outside the barn tilting away from it, and I pulled my sleeping bag over my shoulders to stay warm. Best day of my life was January 9th, 1997. I was eight years old, and my mom and I went to the zoo on a class trip. I liked the bears, she liked the monkeys. Best day ever. End of story. That's it? The colonel said. That's the best day of your whole life. Yep. I liked it. Laura said. I like the monkeys too. Lame. Said the colonel. I didn't think it was lame so much as more of Alaska's intentional vagueness. Another example of her furthering her own mysteriousness. But still, even though, I knew it was intentional. I couldn't help but wonder. What's so fucking great about the zoo? But before I can ask, Laura spoke. Okay, my turn. Said Laura. It's easy. The day I came here. I knew English, and my parents didn't, and we came off the airplane, and my relatives were here, aunts and uncles I had not ever seen in the airport, and my parents were so happy. I was twelve, and I had always been a little baby, but that was the first day that my parents needed me and treated me like a grown-up, because they did not know the language, right? They need me to order food, and to translate tax and immigration forms, and everything else. And that was the day they stopped treating me like a kid. Also, in Romania we were poor, and here we're kinda rich. She laughed. Alright. 
Takumi smiled, grabbing the bottle of wine. I lose. Because the best day of my life was the day I lost my virginity. And if you think I'm going to tell you that story, you're going to have to get me drunker than this. Not bad, the colonel said. That's not bad. You want to know my best day? That's the game, Chip, Alaska said, clearly annoyed. Best day of my life hasn't happened yet. But I, I know it. I see it every day. The best day of my life is the day I buy my mom a huge fucking house. And not just like out in the woods, but in the middle of Mountain Brook with all the weekday warriors' parents. With all y'all's parents. And I'm not buying it with a mortgage either. I'm buying it with cash money. And I'm driving my mom there. And I'm going to open her side of the car door and she'll get out and look at this house. And this house is like picket fence and two stories and everything, you know? And I'm going to hand her the keys to her house. And I'll say, thanks. Man, she helped me fill out my application to this place. She let me come here, and that's no easy thing when you come from where we do. To let your son go away to school? So that's the best day of my life. Takumi tilted the bottle up and swallowed a few times, then handed it to me. I drank, and so did Laura, and then Alaska put her head back and turned the bottle upside down, quickly downing the last quarter of the bottle. As she unscrewed the next bottle, Alaska smiled at the colonel. You won that round. Now what's your worst day? Worst day was when my dad left. He's old. He's like 70 now. And he was old when he married my mom. And he still cheated on her. And she caught him. And she got pissed. So he hit her. And then she kicked him out. And he left. I was here and my mom called. And she didn't tell me the whole story with the cheating and everything. And then hitting until later. She just said he was gone and not coming back and i haven't seen him since all that day i kept waiting for him to call me and explain it but he never did he never called at all i at least thought he would say goodbye or something that was the worst day <sighs> shit you got me beat again i said my worst day was in seventh grade when Tommy Hewitt pissed on my gym clothes and then the gym teacher said I had to wear my uniform or I'd fail the class. Seventh grade gym, right? There are worse things to fail, but it was a big deal then, and I was crying. And trying to explain to the teacher what happened, but it was so embarrassing. And he just yelled and yelled and yelled until I put on these piss-soaked shorts and t-shirt. That was the day I stopped caring what people did. I, I just never cared anymore about being a loser and not having friends, or any of that. So I guess he was good for me in a way, but that moment was awful. I mean, imagine me playing volleyball or whatever in pea-soaked gym clothes while Tommy Hewitt tells everyone what he did. That was the worst day. Laura was laughing. <laughs> I'm sorry, Miles. All good, I said. Just tell me yours so I can laugh at your pain. And I smiled, and we laughed together. My worst day was probably the same day as my best, because I left everything. I mean, it sounds dumb, but my childhood too. Because most 12-year-olds do not, you know, have to figure out W-2 forms. What's a W-2 form? I asked. That's my point. It's for taxes. So, same day. Laura had always needed to talk for her parents, I thought. And so maybe she never learned to talk for herself. And I wasn't great at talking for myself either. We had something important in common. Then, a personality quirk I didn't share with Alaska or anybody else. Although, almost by definition, Laura and I couldn't express it to each other. So maybe it was just the way the not-yet-setting sun shone against her lazy dark curls, but at that moment, I wanted to kiss her, and we did not need to talk in order to kiss. And the puking on her jeans and the months of mutual avoidance melted away. It's your turn, Takumi. Worst day of my life, Takumi said. June 9th, 2000. My grandmother died in Japan. She died in a car accident, and I was supposed to leave to go see her two days later. I was going to spend the whole summer with her and my grandfather, but instead I flew over for her funeral, and the only time I really saw what she looked like, I mean other than in pictures, was at her funeral. She had a Buddhist funeral, and they cremated her, but before they did she was on this, like, well... It's not really Buddhist. I mean, religion is complicated there, so it's a little Buddhist and a little Shinto. But y'all don't care. Point being, she was on 
this like funeral prior or whatever. And that's the only time I ever saw her was just before they burned her up. That was the worst day. The colonel lit a cigarette, threw it to me, and lit one of his own. It was eerie that he could tell when I wanted a cigarette. We were like an old married couple. For a moment, I thought it's massively unwise to throw lit cigarettes around a barn full of hay. But then the moment of caution passed, and I just made a sincere effort not to flick ash onto any hay. No clear winner yet, the colonel said. The field is wide open. Your turn, buddy. Alaska lay on her back, her hands locked behind her head. She spoke softly and quickly, but the quiet day was becoming a quieter night. The bug's gone now with the arrival of winter, and we can hear her clearly. The day after my mom took me to the zoo, where she liked the monkeys and I liked the bears, it was Friday. I came home from school. She gave me a hug and told me to go do my homework in my room so I could watch TV later. I went into my room, and she sat down at the kitchen table, I guess, and then she screamed. And I ran out, and she had fallen over. She was lying on the floor, holding her head and jerking, and I freaked out. I should have called 911, but I just started screaming and crying until finally she stopped jerking. And I thought she had fallen asleep, and that whatever had hurt didn't hurt anymore. So I just sat there on the floor with her until my dad got home an hour later. And he's screaming, why didn't you call 911? And trying to give her CPR. But by then she was plenty dead. Aneurysm. Worst day. I win. You drink. And so we did. No one talked for a minute. And then Takumi asked, Your dad blamed you? Well, not after that first moment. But yeah, how could he not? Well, you were a little kid, Takumi argued. I was too surprised and uncomfortable to talk, trying to fit this into what I knew about Alaska's family. Her mom told her the knock-knock joke when Alaska was six. Her mom used to smoke, but didn't anymore, obviously. Yeah, I was a little kid. Little kids can die on 911. They do it all the time. Give me the wine. She said, deadpan and emotionless. She drank without lifting her head from the hay. I'm sorry, Takumi said. Why did you ever tell me? The colonel asked. His voice soft. It never came up. And then we stopped asking questions. What the hell do you say? In the long quiet that followed, as we passed around the wine and slowly became drunker, I found myself thinking about President William McKinley, the third American president to be assassinated. He lived for several days after he was shot, and toward the end, his wife started crying and screaming, I want to go too. I want to go too. In his last measure of strength, McKinley turned to her and spoke his last words. We are all going. It was the central moment of Alaska's life when she cried and told me that she fucked everything up. I knew what she meant now, and when she said she failed everyone, I knew who she meant. It was the everything and the everyone of her life, and so I could not help but imagine it. I imagined a scrawny eight-year-old of dirty fingers looking down at her mother convulsing. So she sat down with her dead or maybe not mother, who I imagine was not breathing by then but wasn't yet cold either. And in the time between dying and death, a little Alaska sat with her mother in silence. And then through the silence and my drunkness, I caught a glimpse of her as she might have been. She must have come to feel so powerless, I thought. The one thing she might have done, pick up the phone and call an ambulance, never even occurred to her. There comes a time when we realize that our parents cannot save themselves or save us. That everyone who wades through time eventually gets dragged out to sea by the undertow. That, in short... We are all going. So she became impulsive, scared by her inaction into perpetual action. When the eagle confronted her with expulsion, maybe she blurted out Mario's name because the first that came to mind. Because in that moment, she didn't want to get expelled and couldn't think past that moment. She was scared, sure. But more importantly, maybe she'd been scared of being paralyzed by fear again. We are all going, McKinley said to his wife. And we sure are. There's your labyrinth of suffering. We are all going. Find your way out of that maze. None of which I said out loud to her. Not then, and not ever. We never said another word about it. Instead, it became just another worse day, albeit the worst of the bunch, and as night fell fast, we continued on, drinking and joking. 
Later that night, after Alaska stuck her finger down her throat and made herself puke in front of us because she was too drunk to walk into the woods, I lay down in my sleeping bag. Laura was lying beside me in her bag, which was almost touching mine. I moved my arm to the edge of my bag and pushed it so it slightly overlapped with hers. I pressed my hand against hers. I could feel it, although there were two sleeping bags between us. My plan, which struck me as very slick, was to put my arm out of my sleeping bag and put it into hers, and then hold her hand. It was a good plan. But when I tried to actually get my arm out of the mummy bag, I fell around like a fish out of water and nearly dislocated my shoulder. She was laughing. Not with me. At me. But we still didn't speak. Having passed the point of no return, I slid my hand into her sleeping bag anyway, and she stifled a giggle as my fingers traced a line from her elbow to her wrist. That tickles. She whispered. So much for being sexy. Sorry. I whispered. No, it's a nice tickle. She said and held my hand. She laced her fingers in mine and squeezed, and then she rolled over and keased me. I'm sure that she tasted like stale booze, but I did not notice. And I'm sure I tasted like stale booze and cigarettes, but she didn't notice. We were kissing. I thought, this was good. I thought, I am not bad at this kissing. <laughs> not bad at all. I thought, I'm clearly the greatest kisser in the history of the universe. Suddenly, she laughed and pulled away from me. She wiggled a hand out of her sleeping bag and wiped her face. <laughs> you slobbered on my nose. She said and laughed. I laughed too trying to give her the impression that my nose-slobbering kissing style was intended to be funny. I'm sorry. To borrow the bass system from Alaska, I hadn't hit more than five signals in my entire life, so I tried to chalk it up to an experience. I I'm, a I'm a bit new at this, I said. It was a nice slobbering. She said, laughed, and kissed me again. Soon we were entirely out of our sleeping bags and making out quietly. She lay on top of me, and I held her small waist in my hands. I can feel her breast against my chest and she moved slowly on top of me, her legs straddling me. You feel nice, she said. You're beautiful, I said, and smiled at her. In the dark, I could make out the outline of her face and her large, round eyes blinking down at me, her eyelashes almost fluttering against my forehead. Could the two people who are making out please be quiet? The colonel asked loudly from his sleeping bag. Those of us who are not making out are drunk and tired. Mostly drunk, Alaska said slowly, as if enunciation required great effort. We had almost never talked, Laura and I, and we didn't get a chance to talk anymore because of the colonel. So we kissed quietly and laughed softly with our mouths and our eyes. After so much kissing that it almost started to get boring, I whispered, Do you want to be my girlfriend? And she said, Yes, please, and smiled. We slept together in her sleeping bag, which felt a little crowded, to be honest, but was still nice. I never felt another person against me as I slept. It was a fine end to the best day of my life. One day before. The next morning, a term I used loosely since it was not yet dawn, the colonel shook me awake. Laura was wrapped in my arms, folded into my body. We gotta go, Pudge. Time to roll up. Dude, sleeping. You can sleep after we check in. It's time to go! He shouted. All right, all right. I was screaming. Head hurts. And it did. I can feel last night's wine in my throat and my head throbbed like it had the morning after my concussion. My mouth tasted like a skunk had crawled into my throat and died. I made an effort not to exhale near Laura as she groggily extricated herself from the sleeping bag. We packed everything quickly, threw our empty bottles into the tall grass of the field. Littering was an unfortunate necessity at the creek, since no one wanted to throw an empty bottle of booze in a campish trash can and walked away from the barn. Laura grabbed my hand and then shyly let go. Alaska looked like a train wreck, but insisted on pouring the last few sips of Strawberry Hill into her cold, instant coffee before chucking the bottle behind her. Hair of the dog, she said. How you doing? The colonel asked her. I've had better mornings. Hungover? Like an alcoholic preacher on Sunday morning. Maybe you shouldn't drink so much, I suggested. Pudge. She shook her head and sipped the cold coffee and wine. Pudge, what you must understand about me is that I am a deeply unhappy person. We walked side by side down the washed out dirt road on our way back to campus. Just after we reached the bridge, Takumi stopped, said, Uh oh. Got on his hands and knees, and puked a volcano of yellow and pink. Let it out, Alaska said. You'll be fine. He finished, stood up, and said, I found something that can stop the fox. The fox 
cannot summit Strawberry Hill. Alaska and Laura walked to their rooms, planning to check in with the Eagle later in the day, while Takumi and I stood behind the Colonel as he knocked on the Eagle's door at 9 a.m. Y'all are home early. Have fun? Yes, sir, the Colonel said. How's your mom, Chip? She's doing well, sir. She's in good shape. She feed y'all well? Oh, yes, sir, I said. She tried to fatten me up. You need it. Y'all have a good day. Well, I don't think he suspected anything, the colonel said on our way back to room 43. So maybe we actually pulled it off. I thought about going over to see Laura, but I was pretty tired. So I just went to bed and slept through my hangover. It was not an eventful day. I should have done extraordinary things. I should have sucked the marrow out of life. But on that day, I slept 18 hours out of a possible 24. The last day. The next morning, the first Monday for the new semester, the colonel came out of the shower just as my alarm went off. As I pulled on my shoes, Kevin knocked once and then opened the door, stepping inside. You're looking good, the colonel said casually. Kevin's now sported a crew cut, a small patch of short blue hair on each side of his head, just above the ear. His lower lip jutted out the morning's first dip. He walked over to our coffee table, picked up a can of Coke, and spit into it. You almost didn't get me. I noticed it in my conditioner and got right back in the shower. But I didn't notice it in my gel. It didn't show up in Jeff's hair at all, but Longwell and me, we had to go with a marine look. Thank God I have clippers. It suits you, I said, although it didn't. The short hair accentuated his features, specifically his two close-together beady eyes, which did not stand up well to accentuation. The colonel was trying hard to look tough, ready for whatever Kevin might do. But it's hard to look tough when you're only wearing an orange towel. Truce? Well, your troubles aren't over, I'm afraid, the colonel said, referring to the mailed but not yet received progress reports. I, if you say so, we'll talk when it's over, I guess. I guess so, the colonel said, as Kevin walked out. The colonel said, take the can you spit in, you unhygienic shit. Kevin just closed the door behind him. The colonel grabbed the can, opened the door, and threw it at Kevin, missing him by a good margin. Jeez, go easy on the guy. No truce yet, Pudge. I spent that afternoon with Laura. We were very cutesy, even though we didn't know the first thing about each other and barely talked. But we made out. She grabbed my butt at one point. I sort of jumped. I was lying down, but I did the best version of jumping that one can do lying down. And she said, Sorry. And I said, No, it's okay. It's just a little sore from the swan. We walked to the TV room together, and I locked the door. We were watching The Brady Bunch, which she had never seen. The episode where the Bradys visit the gold mining ghost town, and they all get locked up in the one-room jail by some crazy old gold panner with a scraggly white beard, was especially horrible, and gave us a lot to laugh about. Which is good, since we didn't have much to talk about. Just as the Bradys were getting locked in jail, Laura randomly asked me, Have you ever gotten a blowjob? Um, that's out of the blue, I said. The blue? Like, you know... Out of left field. Left field? Like in baseball. Like out of nowhere. I mean, what made you think of that? I've just never given you one. She answered, her little voice dripping with seductiveness. It was so brazen. I thought I would explode. I never thought. I mean, from Alaska, hearing that stuff was one thing. But to hear her sweet little Romanian voice go so sexy all of a sudden? No, I said. I never have. Think it would be fun? Do I? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't have to. I think I want to, she said, and we kissed a little, and then, and then with me sitting, watching the Brady Bunch, watching Marcia, 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 up to her Brady antics, Laura unbuttoned my pants and pulled my boxers down a little and pulled out my penis. Wow, she said. What? She looked up at me, but didn't move. Her face, nanometers away from my penis. It's weird. Uh, what do you mean, weird? Just big, I guess. I can live with that kind of weird. And then she wrapped her hand around it and put it into her mouth. And waited. We were both very still. She did not move a muscle in her body, and I did not move a muscle in mine. I knew that at this point, something else was supposed to happen. But I wasn't quite sure what. She stayed still. I can feel her nervous breath. For minutes. For as long as it took the Bradys to steal the key and unlock themselves from the ghost town jail, she lay there, stock still with my penis in her mouth. And I sat there, waiting. And she took it out of her mouth and looked up at me quizzically. Should I... do something? Uh, um, I don't know, I said. 
Everything I'd learned from watching porn of Alaska suddenly exited my brain. I thought maybe she should move her head up and down, but wouldn't that choke her? So I just stayed quiet. Should I, like, bite? Don't bite. I, I mean, I don't think... I, I think... I mean, that felt good. That was nice. I don't know if there's something else. I mean, you didn't. Um, <laughs> maybe we should ask Alaska. So we went to her room and asked Alaska. She laughed and laughed. Sitting on her bed, she laughed until she cried. She walked into the bathroom, returned with a tube of toothpaste, and showed us in detail. Never have I so wanted to be crest complete. Laura and I went back to her room, where she did exactly what Alaska told her to do, and I did exactly what Alaska said I would do, which was die a hundred little ecstatic deaths, my fists clenched, my body shaking. It was my first orgasm with a girl, and afterward, I was embarrassed and nervous, and so clearly it was Laura, who finally broke the silence by asking, So, want to do some homework? There was little to do on the first day of the semester, but she read for her English class. I picked up a biography of Argentinian revolutionary Che Guevara, whose face adorned a poster on the wall that Laura's roommate had on her bookshelf. Then I lay down next to Laura on the bottom bunk. I began at the end, as I sometimes did with biographies. I had no intention of reading all the way through and found his last words without too much searching. Captured by the Bolivian army, Guevara said, Shoot, coward! You are only going to kill a man. I thought back to Simon Bolivar's last words in Garcia Marquez's novel. How will I ever get out of this labyrinth? South American revolutionaries, it would seem, died with flair. I read the last words out loud to Laura. She turned on her side, placing her head on my chest. Why do you like last words so much? Strange as it might seem, I never really thought about why. I don't know. I said, placing my hand against the small of her back. Sometimes just because they're funny. Like in the Civil War, a general named Sedgwick said, They couldn't hit an elephant from this dis- And then he got shot. She laughed. But a lot of times, people die how they live. And so last words tell me a lot about who people were, and why they became the sort of people biographies get written about. Does that make sense? Yeah. She said, y Yeah? Just yeah? Yeah. She said, and then went back to reading. I didn't know how to talk to her, and I was frustrated with trying, so after a little while I got up to go. I kissed her goodbye. I can do that at least. I picked up Alaska and the colonel at our room, and we walked down to the bridge, where I repeated in embarrassing detail the fellatio fiasco. I still can't believe she went down on you twice in one day, the colonel said. Only technically. Really just once. Alaska corrected. Still, I mean, still. Pudge got his hog smoked. The poor colonel. Alaska said with a rueful smile. I give you a pity blow, but I really am attached to Jake. That's just creepy, the colonel said. You're only supposed to flirt with Pudge. <laughs> but Pudge has a girlfriend. She laughed. That night, the colonel and I walked down to Alaska's room to celebrate our bar night success. She and the colonel had been celebrating a lot the past couple days, and I didn't feel up to climbing Strawberry Hill. So I sat and munched on pretzels while Alaska and the colonel drank wine from paper cups with flowers on them. We ain't drinking out of the bottle tonight, hun. The colonel said. We classin' it up! It's an old-time southern drinking contest. Alaska responded. We's a gonna treat Pudge to an evening of real southern living. We go match each other Dixie Cup for Dixie Cup to the lesser drinker falls. And that is pretty much what they did. Pausing to only turn out the lights at 11 so the eagle wouldn't drop by. They chatted some, but mostly they drank, and I drifted out of the conversation and ended up squinting through the dark, looking at the book spines in Alaska's life library. Even minus the book she'd lost in the mini flood, I could have stayed up until morning reading through the haphazard stacks of titles. A dozen white tulips in a plastic vase were precariously perched atop one of the book stacks, and when I asked her about them, she just said, Jake and my anniversary. And I didn't care to continue that line of dialogue. So I went back to scanning titles, and I was just wondering how I can go about learning Edgar Allan Poe's last words. For the record, Lord, help my poor soul. When I heard Alaska say, Pudge isn't even listening to us. And I said, I'm listening. We were just talking about Truth or Dare. Played out in 7th grade, or still cool? <laughs> Never played it, I said. No friends in 7th grade. Well, that does it. She shouted a bit too loud given the late hour, and also given the fact that she was openly drinking wine in the room. Truth or Dare. All right, I agreed. But I'm not making out with the colonel. The colonel sat slumped in the corner. Can't make out. Too drunk. Alaska started. Truth or dare, Pudge? Dare. Hook up with me. So I did. It was that quick. 
I laughed, looked nervous, and she leaned in and tilted her head to the side, and we were kissing. Zero layers between us, our tongues dancing back and forth in each other's mouth until there was no her mouth and my mouth, but only our mouths intertwined. She tasted like cigarettes and Mountain Dew and wine and chapstick. Her hand came to my face, and I felt her soft fingers chasing the line of my jaw. We laid down as we kissed, she on top of me, and I began to move beneath her. I pulled away for a moment to say, What is going on here? And she put one finger to her lips, and we kissed again. A hand grabbed one of mine, and she placed it on her stomach. I moved slowly on top of her and felt her arcing her back fluidly beneath me. I pulled away again. What about Laura? Jake? Again, she shushed me. Less tongue, more lips. She said, and I tried my best. I thought the tongue was the whole point, but she was the expert. Price! The colonel said quite loudly. That wretched beast. Drama draws nigh. But we paid no attention. She moved my hand from her waist to her breast, and I felt cautiously, my fingers moving slowly under her shirt but over her bra, tracing the outline of her breast and then cupping one in my hand, squeezing softly. You're good at that. She whispered. Her lips never left mine as she spoke. We moved together, my body between her legs. This is so fun. She whispered. But I'm so sleepy. To be continued? She kissed me for another moment, my mouth straining to stay near hers. Then she moved from beneath me, placed her head on my chest, and fell asleep instantly. We didn't have sex. We never got naked. I never touched her bare breast, and her hands never got lower than my hips. It didn't matter. As she slept, I whispered, I love you, Alaska Young. Just as I was falling asleep, the colonel spoke. Dude, did you just make out with Alaska? Yeah. This is going to end poorly, he said to himself. And then I was asleep. That deep can still taste her in my mouth sleep. That sleep that is not particularly restful, but is difficult to wake from all the same. And then I heard the phone ring, I think. And I think, although I can't know, that I felt Alaska get up. I think I heard her leave. I think. How long she was gone is impossible to know. But the colonel and I both woke up when she returned. Whenever that was. Because she slammed the door. She was sobbing like that post-Thanksgiving morning, but worse. I have to get out of here. She cried. What's wrong? I asked. I forgot. God, how many times can I fuck up? She said. I didn't even have time to wonder what she forgot before she screamed. I just have to go. Help me get out of here. Where do you need to go? She sat down and put her head between her legs, sobbing. Just please distract the eagle right now so I can go. Please. The colonel and I, at the same moment, equal in our guilt, said, Okay. Just don't turn on your lights, the colonel said. Just drive slow and don't turn on your lights. Are you sure you're okay? Fuck, she said. Just get rid of the eagle for me, she said. Her sobs, childlike half screams. God, oh God, I'm so sorry. Okay, the colonel said. Start the car when you hear the second string. We left. We did not say, don't drive, you're drunk. We did not say, we aren't letting you in that car when you are upset. We did not say, we insist in going with you. We did not say, this can wait until tomorrow. Anything, everything can wait. We walked to our bathroom, grabbed the three strings of leftover firecrackers from beneath the sink, and ran into the eagles. We weren't sure that it would work again, but it worked well enough. The eagle tore out of his house as soon as the first string of firecrackers started popping. He was waiting for us, I suppose, and we headed for the woods and got him in deeply enough that he never heard her drive away. The colonel and I doubled back, wading through the creek to save time, slipped in through the back window of room 43, slept like babies, 